Well, why, while we are waiting on Jolie, I want to say, anybody know me? I hope so. My name, my, name, my name is Clayton Banks. I am the CEO of Silicon Harlem. And how about this space? You guys like this joint right here? This is cool. That's right, that's right. It's the Harlem School of the Arts. Right next door is a school. The kids come over here. They literally play on the pianos and the guitars. It's such a fun place. Please look up the history of this particular uh, location because it has a very good history. Uh, so I'm very proud that we're able to do it here. Uh, and I'm so happy to see so many people show up at this time of a day, <laughs> right? 3.30? That's an odd number, but it works. So we're so happy to see everybody join here. So. Jolie, how are you doing? Okay. And there's a lot of cool people here, a lot of people that I know. There's not just city folks. I see state folks and perhaps even people outside of New York. And that's a good thing. So because what we're, what's at stake right now, everyone needs to be in this room, but certainly listening. And for those who will be listening throughout the day, we're proud. What Jolie is doing is keeping the streaming going. So we're going to see that across the entire state and where I'm excited about that. And we got a lot of our state folks here. We're going to certainly have plenty of folks coming straight out of the city of, of some of our governance and, um, and all of you who are doing so much great work in New York. So this is a big deal for me personally, perhaps one of the greatest days for me because I've been dreaming of everyone being connected for a long, long time, <laughs> a long, long time. If anybody knows me at any level knows there's one thing I'm quite consistent about, which is everyone has to be connected. I've learned that a long, long time ago. And so it's exciting for me to have this, uh, this day because it's not only just having these breakouts and talking about things, but we really get the voice of people, <laughs> you know, there's $65 billion in the infrastructure bill for connectivity. There's more money is coming all over the places. But when you see that kind of money using my money, it's time for us to really have our voice to the table. And that's why I'm so proud of we're able to be part of that and those who are involved. And I'll talk more about that. I don't want too many people missing this that are watching on the streaming or listening on the streaming. So I'm trying to just like fill in some personal things on me, but we are going to definitely going to make this uh, very clear for everybody. I, I, I'm going to wait for you to just give me the thumbs up, Jolie. I'm sorry, I was ignoring him. What did you say? Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to get moving a little bit. I think we're taking some notes and... Um, we're trying to be as accessible as we possibly can, as you can notice um, on the t TVs and things of that nature. So I'm going to continue to move on because I want to know, have anybody uh, become late at anything. So what I want to do is say that where we're, what, what, what I've been told anyway is because this money is out here, it was uh, absolutely a must have these uh, uh, listening lessons. That's a really key thing. We've already done a few already for, for a variety of reasons, but this one today, in my opinion, is one of the most important ones that we are going to have. It's just super, super important that you add your voice to what's happening. This is no joke at all. And when you think about it, where everyone knows now, especially since the COVID, that we certainly know that everyone has to be connected. The question becomes, how do we get that done? And the good news is we've got a lot of our leaders here that are going to talk some about that. We all know individually what's happening in our homes, in our communities, and people that you know, and, you know, those who are uh, struggling with that. That is something that's going to be the outcomes that come from this conversation today. So if you don't mind, um, is there anything I, else I need to do that anybody needs? Anybody have a question right now? Should I welcome the audience? Why? Oh, um, I think I did say welcome, or maybe I didn't use a word, but 
I definitely hope that you are enjoying the space. I'm glad you're here. You are, a lot of you are my friends, which I'm happy to see. So this is an exciting time for me anyway. Let's make sure we have some, some drinks after this. But uh, we also have another version of this at six o'clock where we're going to be talking to everybody about, you know, their thoughts about this in incredible opportunity that we have. This is incredible. It really is. This, I've been waiting a long time for this, as I keep saying, because this is, this is such an important thing. And I always use uh, one of my analogies, which is if you have a car in New York, which I do, you're going to get a ticket. That just happens in New York. And if you want to pay that ticket, you have to go online. So if you don't have it, you end up in trouble. So we are, uh, have an opportunity to turn that around and make sure everybody has the resources they need uh, to move their lives. So I think uh, I've done my welcome. Jodia, anything else you want me to do? That's Jodia Bunnell. You're going to hear from her later on. She's the boss. She's the boss. So she's, uh, she'll be doing her thing. Um, come on in, all of you who want to come on in, come on in. We, you know, we see you on the other side of the glass. I see you. I see you. I see you. Come on in. Let's get everybody in here. And, and make sure you take an opportunity to get outside and see uh, the rest of this building. It's incredible. So I'm going to, if you don't mind, I would like to move this agenda to another level. We have some great speakers here. Do, should we go to the speakers right away or should we give them, because I know there's some that have to leave. So if you don't mind, I'm going to bring Josh Breitbart up here, who's a very, very good friend of mine. And the guy, in a lot of way, is a, a, he's the one that has the bag of money. All right? He's got the bag of money. So this is the man you want to know. And he's a dear friend. He's a true New Yorker. He uh, is a Brooklyn kid and uh, one of my best friends. So I want to have you say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Clayton. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, let's do that one more time. Good afternoon, everyone. All right. We got, we got a moment of sunshine this beautiful day in this beautiful historic uh, venue, Harlem School for the Arts. Um, thank you. Um, and thank you, Clayton. I have to say, um, I think I've been coming to Silicon Harlem events since before there was a Silicon Harlem, um, when it was a, you know, just a sort of a glimmer. Um, and you know, it is so important to have this ability to bring people together, uh, particularly when we're trying to solve something as um, as entrenched and multifaceted as the digital divide. Uh, my team and I have. Uh, seeing the power of convening all across the state these last few months. We've, we've held these listening sessions in every single region. Um, and in fact, there are events happening like this uh, all across the country in every state and territory uh, to shape the future of the internet as we plan to invest over a billion dollars of state and federal money in New York and tens of billions of dollars, as Clayton said, across the country. Um, and you know, as, as we've been doing this and hearing from all of our colleagues across the country, we've realized this is really the greatest effort at participatory planning that this country has ever done. The idea that we would have this level of engagement uh, to shape something so critical is, is really profound and it's a testament uh, to all the work that, you know, all of you, all of us have been doing for, for all these years. Um, so, you know, after all this travel around the state, just so thrilled to be with you here uh, in New York City, as Clayton said, hometown. So thank you all for coming today. Um, I see many familiar faces in the audience um, and also names on the reg registration list. So I'll see later. If they're not here yet. Um, many of whom I've had a chance to work alongside and people have de dedicated their personal and professional lives to this effort. Uh, I want to note some of our distinguished guests um, that are here with us. Um, or on their way uh, for their public service um, on, on broadband issues and beyond, truly. So um, Senator Kevin Parker, thank you so much, uh, chairs the Committee on Energy and Telecommunications. Uh, we're going to be joined by Senator Kristen Gonzalez, who's the, the chair of the um, Internet and Technology Subcommittee. Um, Council Member uh, Gail Brewer, I believe, is uh, coming as soon as she um, can get through some of the budget conversations that are going um, on at City Council today, um, but certainly a long time um, 
advocate and champion. Um, and of course, uh, Hope Knight, president, CEO, and commissioner of Empire State Development, uh, which oversees the Connect All office. And we'll hear from uh, Commissioner Knight momentarily. Um, and also, uh, we have Albert Polito and uh, Carrie Bronster from uh, representing the governor's office. Thank you so much. Um, and our uh, federal partners, um, Wendy Later, Northeast Regional Director, Jody Vanell, who is the federal program officer for the state of New York, who has been with us across the entire state on this journey. Thank you so much, Jody, um, and great to be with you again today, uh, as well as uh, Bryn Dupree uh, from our neighboring state. Um, thank you so much for, for crossing the border to be with us. It, there's a lot of mutual um, engagement and collaboration in this effort since, uh, since we are all you know, in this process together. Um, also, our partners and co-hosts uh, from the City of New York Office of Technology and Innovation. Um, they have been critical in organizing today's events, and they are leading the way in bringing internet service and digital inclusion programs uh, to New Yorkers. Uh, we have uh, Brett Sykoff, uh, Megan McDermott, uh, and David Reed, I believe uh, I've seen all of you here today, longtime uh, friends and colleagues. Um, and of course, the inimitable Clayton Banks, uh, as well as Claire Yang and the whole team at Silicon Harlem who is making this happen. Uh, thank you so much. Um, lastly, just want to acknowledge uh, my dedicated team from the Connect All office. Um, uh, we are continuing to grow this office. It's an amazing team. I'm so, so thrilled to have them uh, as partners and collaborators. Uh, certainly, Tania Srini, who you'll hear from, New York's first ever Senior Director of Digital Equity. Um, and uh, as well as uh, other folks on our team are here today, um, who most of them are wearing uh, badges, so you can ask them for any kind of help or support that you need. Uh, but we have um, Kirsten Eiler, uh, Rose Anello, uh, Richie Soap, uh, Rob Johnson, Rose Bielan, Alondra Solis, and Cecilia Quirk, uh, as well as our consultants at HRNA Advisors, who've been tirelessly helping us with every aspect of program design. Uh, then lastly, want to acknowledge the HSA staff, um, AV facilities helping arrange this, as well as the people doing the work of uh, ASL interpretation and everything to make this, and live streaming, thank you, Jolie, uh, everything to make this event possible. Uh, so with that, um, it is my privilege uh, to introduce our first speaker, and maybe you and I will sit down when, when, when well, you know, I'm just gonna say, so, so Hope Knight, um, Hope Knight serves as the president. <laughs> President, CEO, and Commissioner of Empire State Development, which is New York State's Economic Development Agency and home of the Connect All office. Um, for all of us who care about closing the, the digital divide in New York, we are so fortunate, and let me tell you this, so fortunate that Connect All is in ESD under Commissioner Knight's leadership. Um, she grew up in East Harlem, and many of you uh, in this area may know her from her work at the Upper Manhattan Empowerment Zone where she was the chief operating officer. Uh, she then served as president and CEO of the Greater Jamaica Development Corporation in Queens. And in 2021, uh, after more than two decades in public and private sector economic development, Governor Hochul uh, nominated her to lead Empire State Development. Uh, Commissioner Knight is dedicated to policies that advance sustainable and inclusive economic growth. And at ESD, she has been instrumental in expanding economic, uh, economic opportunities for New Yorkers through programs and initiatives that touch every corner of our state, including the efforts of the Connect All office to achieve greater digital equity. So please help me in welcoming Commissioner Hope Knight. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you, Josh, for that introduction. And it's great to be back here in Harlem. As Josh mentioned, um, I worked in Harlem for a dozen years and it's so great to be in this facility. I haven't been back since it's been renovated and it's magnificent. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Josh and the Connect All team for putting this all together and hosting similar events all across the state. Um, Josh did uh, acknowledge and mention um, our stakeholders in this event today, but I also want to acknowledge Senator Kevin Parker, who is um, such a true partner in the legislature in helping us make this a reality. Um, 
I'd also like to thank Clayton Banks. I too know Clayton before Silicon Harlem and uh, all of the significant work that he's done in this area. So internet connectivity is one of the biggest challenges of our generation. Uh, COVID-19 exposed how inaccessible and how unreliable a broadband connection was for many New Yorkers. Suddenly we were forced to live our lives through the internet and too many New Yorkers didn't have that option or couldn't afford it. Even as we continue to navigate in this post-pandemic landscape, we know that closing the digital divide is critical to unlocking economic growth and reducing inequities in our society. By connecting families to high-speed internet, we are connecting them to jobs, opportunities, and services. New York is at the forefront of this fight, and Governor Hochul recognizes the urgency and is committed to ensuring that all New Yorkers have access to reliable and affordable broadband service. Last year, the governor launched the historic Connect All initiative. This is the largest ever investment in New York's digital infrastructure. With more than a billion dollars in public investments, Connect All will provide affordable access to New Yorkers in rural and urban areas and continue New York State's leadership in connectivity. A pillar of Governor Hochul's initiative is ensuring equitable access to broadband statewide. That means all New Yorkers will have multiple options for reliable, affordable, high-quality internet service. Digital equity also means that folks should have skills and resources to benefit from the digital economy. Our investments in this area include growing digital literacy programs and computer access so that everyone has an opportunity to use the internet. We'll also consider investments in workforce development as well as telehealth. These efforts will build on the work that we've already done to increase access to affordable high-speed internet. Last year, Governor Hochul launched a multi-agency initiative to build awareness of the Federal Affordable Connectivity Program. That program provides discounts to low-income households. New Yorkers responded, and we are approaching 1.4 million New York households enrolled in the program. That represents over 40% of eligible households collecting over $40 million in federal support each month. That's a game changer for many, many New Yorkers. Now let's talk about today. As part of our efforts, we knew that community input was vital as we explored the obstacles and solutions to digital equity. In March, we launched a series of internet and digital equity listening sessions in each of the 10 regions. The Connect All team partnered with local digital inclusion advocates to hear from those working close to the digital divide. And at each event, we took a deeper dive into the barriers of internet access and the resources and opportunities available to address those barriers. These sessions are about the human side of digital infrastructure and consider things like affordability and digital literacy. Also consider things like how historically marginalized communities can thrive online and how we can be, all be safe and secure when we go online. Following these sessions and in conjunction with other data collection efforts, the Connect All team will lead the development of New York's first ever statewide digital equity plan. This will be done in collaboration with other state and local agencies, plus private and not-for-profit organizations, and many New York residents. It will be submitted to the federal government before the end of the year and will help secure federal funding to establish a dig digital equity grant program. The plan will serve as the guiding framework for all of our Connect All programs, including grants related to affordable housing and public infrastructure. It will also consider factors like quality of service, affordability goals, and digital skills acquisition. It will be grounded in input 
that we've received from listening sessions like this one, bringing your vision to the forefront. Digital equity is leading the discussions and guiding our efforts rather than supplementing. Events like this today are vital to the process to help us understand, learn, and develop solutions. So in closing, investing in our broadband connectivity is investing in economic development. It's investing in our future because connectivity means opportunity. Digital equity is just one way that we continue to expand opportunity under the governor's leadership. We will continue working with our state and community partners to bring affordable high-speed internet to all New Yorkers. Thank you for being here at this very important event today. Together, we're closing the digital divide, growing our digital infrastructure, and supporting digital equity for all New Yorkers. Thank you. Outstanding. Thank you so much. It was really, uh, <clears throat> I almost cried out there. So uh, keep following what we're talking about here. You're hearing it from the top levels of our state here. And uh, I just want to do a quick survey. I get to do that, you know. So I want to do a survey. Raise your hand if you think everyone will be literally having connected internet in their home, working, not like just that it hasn't, but actually working uh, within the next five years. Every single person in New York State will have it in their home within the next five years. We got a lot of work to do. <laughs> we got a lot of work to do, Josh. Wow. Okay. Ten years? This is absolutely New York. I love it. This is, no. Okay. Fifteen? Twenty? All right, we got a lot of work to do, people. Kevin, you ready for this? This is amazing. We're gonna, we're gonna get to some more speakers here. We have two senators here, two New York State senators here. When was the last time you were in a room with two New York senators talking about broadband? Okay, I'm getting out of myself here. So we're gonna bring up New York State Senator Kristen Gonzalez. Come on up, but Ken, uh, Kristen Gonzalez is the youngest woman to ever be selected in the New York State Senate. She is a Queens native. Oh, yeah, that's, that's something. That's something. Yes. I was young once. Um, she's a former tech worker. She's obviously from Queens. Uh, former tech worker and community organizer. Oh, communi uh, former tech worker. That's my thing. We're going to talk. All right. A, com a community organizer who lives in Long Island City. She was raised in Elmhurst by a single mother from Puerto Rico. At age 12, she received a scholarship to a private high school on the Upper East Side. The experience of navigating between a working class neighborhood in Queens and an upper class neighborhood in Manhattan led her to fight for social justice and put her on a path to public service. Before being elected to the New York State Senate, Senator Gonzalez worked in the New York City Council, the Obama White House, and Senator Chuck Schumer's office. She has also organized in her community with the Western Queens. Aren't you in Vanel Queens, or you used to be at some point? Community Land Trust served on her community board and helped launch citywide campaign for public internet, my favorite thing. Come on up here, Senator. All right. No, no, it's... Hi, everyone. How, how are we doing today? Are we feeling good? I see some enthusiastic faces. Thank you so much for the introduction. My name is Senator Kristen Gonzalez. I represent a three borough district. So I represent Queens, as you heard, where I was born and raised. Uh, Manhattan as well. Do we have any Manhattanites in the house? We're in Harlem, so we should. All right. And do we have any Brooklynites in the house? Because I represent Brooklyn. Okay, that's pretty good. And then, of course, we had Queens. I heard some Queens load. That's 
Amazing. So, um, you know, I'm in my first term and I'm the current chair of the Internet and Technology Committee. And it's such an immense honor to be here because an essential part of my path into politics was digital equity. You know, as you heard, I was a tech worker. I worked at a credit card company on their data side. I was a product manager um, leading, you know, pretty much their or engineering teams, right, and our UI UX developers. Um, but I didn't always work in that industry. I had also worked in politics. But early on, I learned the effect of the digital divide and the power of the internet. You know, when I went from a public school to a private school, I found out about that private school. Well, not myself, because at the time I was in fifth grade. Um, and believe me, I look young, but I still remember dial-up. Uh, <laughs> but we learned about that private school because my mom conducted a simple Google search. Having access to the internet and the ability to be online to access information can be absolutely game-changing for families. So I very much echo the sentiment that you heard earlier in the remarks that ensuring that we're closing the digital divide is economic development. It's what defined my own life. And then going on, you know, and becoming a tech worker while also organizing through the pandemic, what I did was I saw that there was an incredible need for access to the internet. My mom's a teacher, her students weren't connected, and you heard about that earlier too. But in addition to that, it wasn't just access to, to broadband, but it was the ability to pay for a light bill. It was the ability to pay for your hardware, right? So whether it's a phone or a laptop and if it's broken, being able to afford those repairs. And what I did along with some other organizers was start a mutual aid fund specifically to help close the digital divide. And so when I look around this room, I'm really excited because I know that when we're here, what we're really doing is trying to have a holistic approach to digital equity and hearing the framing of this conversation be economic development and affordable housing and the ability to pay our bills for working class New Yorkers, that's so important because that's what people were struggling with during the pandemic. And it's certainly what we're continuing to struggle with now as we see a rise in the cost of living. Um, you know, after that, or during the pandemic, we also started a campaign for universal internet and internet as a right and a utility. Um, and that was coming from the same place as not only seeing the need for access, but really understanding that, you know, we, as, as our technology is rapidly advancing, we can't continue to see that gap expand. And so a lot of folks organize unions, you know, nonprofits, community-based organizations, and we launched the campaign for public internet. So again, it just feels so incredible to be here. Um, you know, as chair of internet technology this year, we passed a bill that I'm very proud of to expand uh, Wi-Fi to all shelters in New York, which is... <laughs> <laughs> because we know that after surveying right here in New York, what folks who are in the most marginalized, most vulnerable communities use the internet for, 70% said to find housing. 60% said to find job opportunities. 40% said, you know, of those who were living in shelters and temporary housing, said they were using it actually for access to help and information. So, um, so there's so much work to do. I, the work that we're doing here is important. I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank our hosts, the governor's office, Connect All for taking on this incredibly urgent challenge. Um, and I also want to thank, you know, Senator Cordell Clear, who is the senator for this district, but is, has been a longtime supporter, um, as well as Senator Parker, who's the chair of, you know, energy and telecommunications, where I sit on as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Senator Parker. And then thank you all again so much for being here. Thanks. Already trying to take my job, I'll tell you what. And, um, but thank you for those remarks and certainly the great work you're doing. We were talking about artificial intelligence recently and there's some great um, ideas that she has around that to make that a little bit more safe for everybody. Um, but we're gonna keep the program going because we have another Senator here, a real uh, hardworking person. I've, I've for a long time have followed you Sir, even though we've not had as much uh, connected that I want, I've been following you. And your work is incredible. He is a fierce champion of economic development, education, energy, domestic violence issues, and human and civil rights. I could stop right there, but I'm going to keep going. Senator Parker represents the intrinsically 
diverse 21st Senate District in Brooklyn. Senator Parker has been a professor of both African-American studies and political science at several CUNY and SUNY colleges. He received his Bachelor of Science degree in public service from Penn State and holds a Master of Science degree from the New School for Social Research and Urban Policy and Management. He is currently pursuing a doctoral degree. Do we get that done yet? Okay, we get uh, in political science at the Graduate Center, CUNY. Formerly, Senator Parker served in government affairs of the chairman's office at UVS uh, Payne Weber, where and focused on broad issues, importance to the financial service industry. A lifelong Brooklyn resident, Senator Parker has been a Flatbush resident for more than 31 years, nurtured, educated, and employed in the borough. Senator Parker is intimately familiar with the needs of the 21st District, which consists of many diverse communities, Flatbush, East Flatbush. I know who's Flatbush in here. Don't get me wrong. Kensington, Dittmas Park, Mildwood, Flatlands, Canarsie. Anybody Canarsie? Oh, uh, Georgetown, Old Mill Basin, Mill Basin, Bergen Beach, and Marine Park. That's Mr. Brooklyn. Let's go, New York State Senator Kevin Parker. Uh, thank you, Clayton. I appreciate it. I want to just announce uh, today that Clayton's new job will be following me around, introducing me at every single thing that he goes to. Um, thank you for that generous introduction. I appreciate it. Um, I'm glad that you didn't go any further. Um, having been in politics a long time, my, you know, you know, and we're politicians, so, you know, we like to make things big. Uh, last week, I actually spoke at a school, Kristen. You know, we do that a lot, especially this time of year. And I'm speaking at PS6 in the auditorium and they run through my whole bio and they said it used to work for the city council for Una Clark and used to work for the first governor Cuomo and used to work for Payne Weber and used to work for Carl McCall. Little girl stood up and said, what's the matter, mister? You can't keep a job. <laughs> so, so I didn't know how this was going to go today. So I appreciate you being, being generous with it. Uh, again, I'm State Senator Kevin Parker and um, I'm the chairman of the Energy and Telecommunications Committee as well as the majority whip in the New York State Senate. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a Democratic whip does, um, I describe it as um, catching smoke with a net. So, you know, as you know, anybody in here, the Democrat knows that the idea of Democratic discipline is an oxymoron. So uh, it's, it's a difficult job. Um, but I'm happy to be here at the Harlem School of the Arts as a kid who uh, was forced to play the piano for a number of years. And uh, at Midwood High School, uh, in my neighborhood where I went, I played the clarinet in both the band and the orchestra. And so uh, I have a great appreciation uh, for being here. Uh, but none of that is as important of, of the fact that we're down the block from Famous Fish. And so <laughs> those who know, know. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you leave here, you feel the nausea, just walk up the block and I, I promise you, you're going to be happy when you leave. It's well worth the trip. Um, look, there's so much uh, that needs to be uh, discussed here, and I'm certainly uh, not the smartest person in this room on, on, on this issue, and so I'm going to leave some room for other folks to talk uh, about, about the things that are important around uh, digital equity and about how we, in fact, uh, deal with the issue of broadband and, and access to it. Let me thank uh, Senator Gonzalez um, for acknowledging me, but for her hard work, and she mentioned that she's on my committee, but I'm also on her committee. Um, and so we work together and um, share leadership on, on these issues that are that's so critical, important for our community. And certainly also want to acknowledge uh, Senator Cordell Clare, whose district that we're in, and her advocacy on this issue and many, many more. And anywhere that we're talking about um, any kind of um, social disparity, you're going to find Cordell Clare standing in the gap. Um, making sure that people are served, and um, and so just we want to acknowledge her leadership and the important work that she's that she that she's doing uh, in Albany for all of you. So, you know, we really when we talk about kind of 
you know, what's happening in the space around the digital divide um, as we discuss um, digital equity, um, I kind of categorize it in kind of two ways, right? First, we have a hardware issue where people just, in, in, especially in black and Latino communities and in um, low income communities just literally don't have access um, to hardware. They don't have laptops, they don't have tablets. Um, and that's still a real thing. When we first started talking about the digital divide, that's one of the things um, that we talked about. And having access to smartphones is, is a step, but it's not there yet, right? Um, and then we have now the new digital divide, which is access to high-speed broadband. Access to high-speed broadband needs to be a right in the state of New York. It is as important as gas, water, and electricity. We would never put anybody in housing anywhere in the state of New York um, without those three things, and, and um, high-speed broadband has to be the third. Uh, I'm sorry, the fourth. Um, counting is not in my committee, but um, but um, that should be really the fourth right, and it really needs to be something that we embrace in in that way. Um, to just simply say everybody must have access to it. And I am frankly um, pessimistic because I've been doing this a long time, and I feel like we have not really um, put our energy to it the way we need to. And it really, as you, as you heard Senator Gonzalez discuss, um, there's almost no aspect of our lives um, that doesn't demand the need um, for, for high-speed broadband. And whether we're talking about health equity, or we're talking about access to housing, you know, applying for a job, um, you know, um, you know it, it, it just, there's nothing that doesn't require this. Um, I told a story earlier on a city and state panel about one of the things that happened in politics during the, the pandemic. When they were starting giving out the, the vaccine, the first group that was able to get the vaccine, people may remember, were senior citizens, right? But the only way you can actually sign up for it is actually online. Right. Right? So we took the, the, the group of people who were are least digitally prepared and then demanded that f to save their lives that the only way that they could, they could get this access is, is to be on immediately. And so our offices immediately became places where we literally, you know, was sitting in our offices all day calling a list of senior citizens in our district as many as we could and say, do you need an appointment? You know, can we give you an appointment to help you? And literally stand there on our state computers and, and sign people up like telemarketers, right? And it's really not where we, we should be. Um, and so there's a lot of work um, that needs to be done. I also, the other um, dichotomy that I actually draw in, in this um, digital equity issue is the issue of build out versus adoption, right? And in some places, I shouldn't say some places, in every place we have, an adopt, we have a build out problem, right? There's some places that in urban areas that are not properly built out, but urban areas are more built out than rural areas, right? And so as a statewide elected official, I'm dealing with my colleagues across the state all the time who have communities who can't get to the, the, the last mile, right? For some of you who live in Brooklyn, you can't imagine that your, na your, your closest neighbor may be five miles away, um, but there's literally communities um, like that, right? And, and so we have to kind of figure that out, and we have to figure out places in New York City in which we haven't had a proper build out, or where we don't have enough providers in those communities um, to, to provide the services. And then the other part of the dichotomy is adoption. And the vast, the vast amount of, of adoption issues is around cost. And so I'm really proud of having um, put in the first legislation that created some cost contain containment measures around cost that later got adopted in the budget. Um, when I put it in, I was talking about $5 a month, and I know all the, all the uh, ISPs were like gasping. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we put it at $10. I wanted to put it at 5 They wouldn't let me put it in at 5 So I put it in at 10 We passed it at 15 and then the courts make us, made us take it to 30 right? And so we have a $30 program here running uh, in the state of New York. Um, and although that is okay, it's not really, I like to see us lower, to be honest with you. I like us to be in a place where, again, this should be something that should be a right. Everybody should be able to get it, and they, they shouldn't have to go broke in order to have access to something that you need integrally um, you know, for your life. Um, and so um, I think that we're gonna need um, more people providing services. I think we're gonna need, um, you know, one of the things I was an early um, proponent of is municipal programs 
around that. And I know I have some people, you know, quaking in their boots, but like I think that we have to. I think this is, we have to have an all of the above approach in this. And um, looking forward to hearing other folks' ideas. Um, I'm primarily here to extend my hand in partnership, not just to my colleagues in government, um, but also to people in communities who are committed to addressing these issues. Um, we want to work with you, um, which is why you have two legislators who have traveled, uh, you know, across the world in the middle of the day uh, to discuss this, um, because we really want to hear from you, and not just today, but as things come up, reach out to us um, and let us know your, you know, specifically your solutions for how we address some of these issues, right? I mean, we've heard a lot of the problems already. I'm sure there's more that we're going to hear about, um, but I'm really interested in solutions and things that you think that we could be doing on the state level um, to, in fact, improve um, access. Uh, and I want to just thank the Connect All office for the work that they're doing and Hope Knight for her leadership um, and all of the people here in the community who, who, who uh, are engaged in this. Um, and I just want to just let everybody know the last dichotomy I'm going to talk about is that any problems that you're hearing about in your communities, feel free to reach out to Senator Gonzalez directly. Um, she's available day and night um, for that. If you're having awards, barbecues over the summer, um, parties, as we say in Flatbush Fets, reach out to me. I'm available to attend. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of work to be done, but I'm glad that we're all working uh, together to get it done. Um, and it's really only together um, that we're going to resolve this. Thank you so much, and I look forward to our work together. How about that? The doctor. Um, we're going to keep the moving the program, but I do want to double down on what you said, uh, Senator. This is no longer a luxury, which a long time internet was. And now we, as a state and as a city, uh, we basically have moved all of our civics to the internet. If you don't have the internet, you're no longer a citizen. I know that's very dramatic, but it's sort of true. You know, I mean, it's like if you're going to have to go online to do th certain things like deal with the government, you've got to have to have the Internet. So I'm glad that you brought that. And uh, there are a lot of opportunities to make that happen. And this is probably the most significant one we have in front of us. So we're going to move the uh, agenda here and we're going to bring up another incredible person that's uh, joining us. And I believe... You are here. Uh, Jodia is from NTIA. I think we have Wendy later here. Is that? Oh, there she is. How are you? Good. Let me introduce you. So everybody listen here. Wendy serves as the Northeast Regional Director of the Office of Internet Connectivity and Growth with NTIA. She has extensive background in private public partnerships and high profile federal and local government projects in technology and telecommunications. That's exactly what we need. So I'm very happy to bring her up, say a few words. Please come on up, Ms. Later. Hi, everyone. It's, it's great to see so many familiar faces today, uh, some who I haven't seen in a number of years. Um, Thank you so much, Clayton. Thank you so much, the Connect All office. Uh, we have had a wonderful partnership. Um, I'm very grateful to uh, how well you've built out this office and what great, strong people you've brought in. Um, and I think that New York City and New York State is in good hands as a result. So very grateful to be here today. As Clayton mentioned, I'm the Northeast Regional Director. I uh, work with federal program officers in 10 states from Maine all the way down to Delaware. But New York City is my home. I live in Brooklyn. I'm a native New Yorker. Um, I thought that I was a constituent of Kevin Parker's until I heard your list, but uh, I still get his mailings. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, what I really care about is, is New York most of all and New York City more than anything. And I want to be sure that we close the digital divide here once and for all. 
Um, before I took this position, I was at CUNY for many years. Um, and so I saw firsthand what the digital divide meant. We all have our stories of what happened when COVID hit. And uh, I was working with the chief uh, information officer of the university and COVID hit, classes went remote. And we were contacted by more than 30,000 students who didn't have devices. And so we scrambled to get devices into their hands. And then we learned that thousands more didn't have internet access. So again, we scrambled to get hotspots. That was the best that we could do very quickly. Um, so having lived through this, and I know you all have examples of what you've lived through, we know that it is time to close the digital divide. And we're really at a historic moment with $65 billion, as Clayton and Josh have mentioned. 48 billion come, are coming through my agency, NTIA, to New York State. And with that, they are gonna figure out where the last residences and businesses are that need to be connected and what the needs are what the digital equity needs are. As Hope Knight mentioned, it's a question of digital li literacy, upskilling, digital navigators, equipment, to a whole range of things. And so that's why it's essential to have these kinds of meetings and hearing from you, getting your input, hearing what it is that you need so that we know that we can bridge the digital divide in New York. So I'm gonna close there. Um, You've heard Jodia's name a number of times. Jodia is our federal program officer for New York State. She's been crisscrossing New York with the Connect All office. And um, if you don't know Jodia currently, get to know her because she is your point person for the federal government in New York. And I look forward to talking to you all through the program and at the reception. Thank you. Thank you very much for those remarks. And if you were listening carefully, sounds like she has some pockets of money. So that's a cool thing to hear. Uh, but Wendy, I'm get to introduce Jodia. Okay. All right. So I do get the honor of bringing up Jody Vanell. You're going to love her. So Jody is with the New York State Federal Program, and she is the officer. Uh, at NTIA, as uh, Ms. Slater was talking about. And Wendy, uh, I'm sorry, and Jodia serves as the federal program officer for the state of New York with U.S. Doc NTIA's Too Many Letters, Jodia. Um, formerly, she served as a client executive at Microsoft, cultivating long-term and relationships with government stakeholders. I think she's one of the great uh, leaders in our state. She's great in the country. She literally does the whole country. And she's just a good friend. So I'm very honored to bring her up. Come on up, Jody Ivanell. Mark and Bryn, do you want to join the stage? I know it's very unscripted. Well, um, Welcome everyone, welcome to Harlem. Give yourself a round of applause for being here. Woo! I'm a former resident of Harlem, so I lived right up the street and it's a beautiful space and I have not seen it since the renovation. So really happy to be here. Um, I'm going to give about two minutes of my time to these spectacular folks. We talk about the power of collaboration and we have Bryn Dupree who represents New Jersey and we're always collaborating together. So I just wanna give her 30 seconds-ish intro. And then I also wanna bring you your attention to Mark Cologne who sits on our national level and travels the country in the US territories to talk about the story of internet for all. So one minute, Mark, 30 seconds. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Bryn Dupre, Federal Program Officer for New Jersey. We do work closely together. Infrastructure transcends state boundaries, even if our funding streams are by state geographic territories. So great to be here. 
Also, I'm a New York City resident, so really excited to hear uh, more what everyone's saying about the digital divide right here. Thank you, everyone. Um, I am just, uh, I bring greetings from uh, President Biden, Vice President Harris. Um, this program is a priority for the president. He promised to bring, uh, to connect everyone in America, every business and residence to affordable, reliable, high-speed internet. Not too much pressure. But um, although I cover, I cover the country, um, I'm a native New Yorker. Um, I started organizing political, uh, politically here with your state senator uh, a long, long time ago with Cordell Clear. Um, and I, can ha I only have to say, as a cynical New Yorker, and I realize that's uh, duplicative, right? Um, uh, I am just incredibly heartened by the intellectual, political, and community firepower that's here today. Um, I see the uh, first New York City's first chief technology officer is here today. Um, my friend Diana Cava from the Hispanic Federation, the largest Hispanic organization. You have incredible, incredible fighters on, on your side here. Um, the two senators, Senator Parker, who I've also known for a very long time, Senator Gonzalez, passed a bill so that every, every homeless shelter has high-speed internet. Every child that doesn't have a place necessarily to live permanently but they will be able to do their homework. That is really, really, really inspiring. And I, um, I'm just so glad to be here. And we look forward to hearing from all of you and all of your incredible ideas on how to close the digital divide. Okay, so let me try to make this as quick as possible by reading my notes. Um, good afternoon again. It's a great day to be in New York City and in Harlem. We're kicking off our 10th listening session in the final one. So. Goodbye for now, Josh <laughs> and Tanaya. We've been crisscrossing the state uh, since March and been exhausted, been through the mountains, been to the Capitol, and I'm happy to bring it back home uh, to New York City. Um, this is a combination and collaborating with so many folks. So we're bringing five boroughs together uh, today. Um, thank you to Silicon Harlem for uh, being our host um, at the famed uh, Harlem School of the Arts. Uh, thank you to Empire State uh, Development, the Connect All Office, the New York City Leadership Team at uh, the Office of Technology and Innovation, also OTI, to all of the electeds that are coming and going. Um, because of all of you all today, we're able to have such a successful uh, beginning and journey together. I'm Jody Ovenel, I'm the Federal Program Officer. Uh, to the great state of New York on behalf of the U.S. Department of Commerce. And I know Clayton said this, this name is forever and I wish I could change it, but we can't. Uh, it's the National Telecommunication Information uh, Administration, also known as NTIA, together with the partnership and collaboration uh, with New York State Development um, and the Connect All Office, headed by the great Josh Breitbart. Um, we're committed to bringing affordable and accessible broadband uh, to the state of New York. So let's Let's just talk really quickly, how are we going to do this? Um, so under our program, under the BEAD program, which is broadband equity, access and deployment, um, and digital equity, we're committed to working uh, together uh, in New York um, and in communities just like this so that we could listen, plan, and uh, deploy broadband all across the great state of New York over the next several years. We can't do this without your input, your guidance, and your help. So with that, uh, we're here to really listen to you today and get all of your feedback. Uh, Josh and the team, um, has provided, will provide rather, an overview of Connect All and how we're collaborating together. And you'll hear about like the various initiatives. And again, we're really here to listen today um, and hear directly from you. And we will be here to uh, interact with you. So please uh, say hello. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Another source for everybody to get connected with. Um, I have to acknowledge somebody who just, if you don't mind tonight, just came in and uh, a dear friend of mine, a representative of mine uh, right here in Harlem, uh, one of the greats here. Uh, Al Taylor, you wanna come up and say hello to the folks here? This is Al Taylor, our assemblyman here. My bless you. 
Hi, good afternoon, everyone. How you doing? It's okay. I know when you go into the tech world, you'll be like, everybody's doing all right? Do it like this. And now we have artificial intelligence that can do that for you. So be careful. Pinch the person next to you to make sure they're real. No, don't do that. Just tease it. It is great. This is a great opportunity. I see my colleague in the back, uh, Senator uh, Lord Parker. I apologize. I was going to call you Perkins because he's in my mind. Senator Parker, God bless you. Great man. Uh, thank you for coming to my neighborhood. I actually live here, grew up here. And I was saying, thank God. As I looked at that building right there, that new building that you're looking at, that building saved my life. No lie. As, as a kid living right here, that was a vacant lot for almost 40 years. And so when I would get a haircut, literally, I would get a haircut on the corner. And then I would have to sneak through the alleyways to make sure the bullies didn't slap the back of my head. When you were kids, the big guys wanted to. So it's real. And this technology changes how and what our children can be just having another outlet. Because once you've been impacted by something, it can change a narrative for where you find yourself. And one of the things that Clayton, my good friend who's been educating me um, from day one, before we went into um, COVID, we understood and he was educating me that the broadband system that we have is ineffective and we need to do more. And when the pandemic hit, we understood how far behind we were, especially in the communities of color. So this is a great opportunity. I would love to tell you, I'm going to stay and listen and learn a lot, but they're going to give it to me in bite sizes later on because I got a couple of more of these to do, but I just want to say welcome. Thank you. It's good to see Jody in our neighborhood. And we talked about this when she was making that transition. I said, you got to come to my neighborhood. You got to come to my neighborhood. Do you know Clinton Banks? He's the coolest, coolest, coolest geek I know. <laughs> That's a good thing today. Back then, you know, Urkel days, it wasn't. So listen, let me get out of the way. I know you have a program. See, it's all right to laugh, folks. It's okay. That way, you know, the person next to you is not AI because they're laughing, right? <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a great day and listen well. I've been called worse, so I am an OG. That means old geek, okay? Uh, so we have uh, another speaker. Thank you again, Al Taylor, for your service. Appreciate it. Uh, so let's get the words together. So we have our next speaker, who is Tanaya. And she's not only a speaker here, but she's sort of the part of the team that put this whole thing together. So I'm very proud to be able to bring her up here. Uh, so if I can only find your words here, yeah, here we go. Oh, she's saying to me to skip it, but I can't just skip it. So Tanaya serves as the Senior Director of Digital Equity for New York State Connect All Office. Previous, previously, Tanaya served as a Technology Fellow for the Ford Foundation and a research manager for the National Housing Law Project. She knows everything. Come on up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Clayton. Um, I just have to give a shout out to Clayton and Claire. Uh, they're obviously such pillars of the community here. They have also been pillars uh, for, of my sanity for the past several weeks um, as we got this event together. And thank you all so much for being here. Um, so I have the fun task of, I'm actually going to use the slides. I'm not like the magnanimous speaker um, that, we've, that we've heard. Um, but I have the task of telling you a little bit about the Connect All office. So um, last year, Governor Hochul announced the historic Connect All program. As you heard, it is New York's biggest ever investment in its digital infrastructure. Um, so this is really our way of meeting the moment of the infrastructure bill. Um, this, the infrastructure bill created um, unprecedented once-in-a-generation funding to close the digital divide. And as you can see here, we have a really comprehensive suite of tools. These are our five signature programs um, that we operate in Connect All. I uh, won't um, get into the details of all of them, but across them, we have you know, grant programs, technical assistance, other support for municipalities, businesses, community organizations, um, and we're working on policy innovation and regulatory reform. So we really feel like we have a holistic approach and we were designed to address all of the aspects of the digital divide. We have tools to do that. Um, but the main one that we want to talk about today is the statewide digital equity plan. Um, that plan, as uh, has been mentioned before, while it is uh, one of our five signature programs, we have a grant program that we'll be operating. 
uh, it also is the guiding document for all of the investment. And um, as you've heard, we've heard different numbers get thrown around, but we have over a billion dollars in New York um, to address the digital divide. And it's all going to be guided by that digital equity plan. So digital equity is really the center of what we're talking about. Um, and, it's, and it's what we're here to do today. Um, so this is the side where I talk around our definition of digital equity. Um, and that's by design because we really have the opportunity today to um, manifest what digital equity means to New Yorkers. And so I'm going to give you a set of principles that um, we are grounding this work in at Connect All. They come from our team's experience in this field, some for several years, some for several decades. Um, but what you should know is that this is really a draft. We want to know how these principles land in your communities. So I'll just talk through a few of them. Um, so obviously, the first is equity. And so when we talk about digital equity, a lot of times you, you have the three pillars, right? You have access, you have um, affordability, and you have devices and digital skills. We want to broaden that definition a little bit. Um, in terms of equity, what we're really trying to say is that nobody experiences a barrier to connectivity because of who they are, where they live, how much money they have. We also want to make sure that all of the opportunities that you've heard about um, and that you will hear about that are presented by the internet are widely shared. So that could be educational benefits, that could be economic benefits, and, and that's what we mean when we talk about equity. Um, in terms of performance, we want to make sure that all New Yorkers have access to robust, reliable, and responsive service. And we want you to have a choice in that service. That's not only a choice in providers, you'll hear from a lot of um, the many providers that New York City has a little bit later. We also want you to have a choice in the type of plans available to you. And you know, inherent in this principle is the idea that internet users have an understanding of the service they're entitled to, and they have a clear mechanism for um, how to actually receive that level of service. Um, the fourth principle is fairly self-explanatory, it's affordability. Um, we want to make sure that all New Yorkers can afford the internet. And again, they don't have to choose between this and any other essential service. Um, and the last principle is safety. We want to make sure that New Yorkers can thrive in their online environments. Once we get you online, we want you to be safe. We want you to understand um, cybersecurity and privacy. But we also want you to have a sense of comfort and well-being online. Um, so throughout this process, again, we want to hear where these principles resonate with you. If there are other ones that you want to raise, that would be really great to surface today. Um, and we also want to know how we should measure progress towards these goals. So that's going to be part of the conversation. Next slide, please. OK. Um, those principles, realizing those principles is obviously a really tall order. Um, as Josh said, we're extremely motivated by the fact that um, this is our country's most ambitious exercise in direct democracy when we're thinking about infrastructure ever. Um, that's a lot of pressure but uh, it is extremely motivating to us. It's why we're here today. It's why we've been crisscrossing the state um, for several months. And as you heard from our federal partners, every state and territory in the country is undertaking this very same planning process. And we all have the same mandate to close the digital divide. Um, our approach in New York begins with these listening sessions, which are the first step in our planning process. And the planning process will run through the rest of the year. So. Throughout this process, we'll develop the state digital equity plan. Um, today's purpose is to really start the conversation that will manifest the community vision. As you see, that's one part of the plan. Um, we'll start to talk about the gaps, the needs, the challenges. Um, I think Senator Parker said that he hears a lot about challenges, and, and so do we. And so we also want to make sure to hear about what's working so that we can scale that. We actually have resources, finally, to scale the programs that um, have been working and to really amplify all of your great work that has been going on for, for um, several decades now. Um, next slide, please. So our plan will be informed with input by stakeholders, as I said, a really participatory process. Um, and it will, uh, today we want to center what are called covered populations in the Digital Equity Act. So those include low-income households, veterans, aging individuals, incarcerated individuals, people with disabilities, people with language barriers, racial and ethnic minorities, and rural residents. So that's, if you belong to any, um, uh, if you hold any of the identities that you see on the left side of the screen, today um, we really want to center your um, experiences. On the right side are all of the other stakeholders that make up the digital equity ecosystem, and they're all extremely important. I'll talk through in a second some of the other opportunities we have to hear from you. But if you belong to one of those groups, um, today is really to listen to um, lived experts from the covered populations. And so 
um, we invite uh, anyone that, that identifies as one of the groups on the left to really have their voice heard today. Um, next slide. Okay, so our plan will also consider how digital equity can improve outcomes in five key areas, um, including health, workforce development, education, civic and social en engagement, and the accessibility of government services. Um, we've partnered with the New York State Library to convene a digital equity task force, and that task force really coordinates expertise across the state government as well as across the field um, all over the state to bring all of that really great expertise to bear on our state digital equity plan. Each of the subcommittees you see listed here is chaired by um, state government experts as well as external experts um, in the field. And we're hosting public meetings all through the summer to dive into things like, um, you know, we had our education meeting last month and we talked about how you actually teach safety and cybersecurity because it's assumed that young people know these things and that's, that's not actually true. Um, in our telehealth conversation that's coming up, we're gonna be talking, uh, in our health meeting, we're gonna be talking about telehealth, we're gonna be talking about social isolation. And so this is really an opportunity to dive into specifics. Um, and we welcome you to share these meetings widely. They're available on our website and please attend also. Um, we really wanna hear from you. Next slide. Okay, so just to give you a broader sense of all the engagement CAO is doing, um, we've completed nine of 10 listening sessions. This is our last one. And um, the slides and the summary notes from each session are on our website. If you check out those slides and the summary notes, you'll start to understand um, the variations by region because we live in a really diverse state, um, but also the themes that have been emerging across the sessions. Um, I know of exactly one person that has uh, um, logged on to the website and, he, and he's here today and he said that they're really helpful. So please take a look uh, when you get the chance. Um, we also partnered with digital equity coalitions in every region across the state to collect more insights from communities. So currently they are convening 30 plus focus groups across the state and each of those focus groups are um, centered on a covered population. So we're really trying to get to the lived experts um, and really understand what their needs are. We have a series of virtual forums for different stakeholders that will kick off at the end of the month. First up um, is for ISPs. Uh, we also have a session on um, community anchor institutions. And so if you um, represent any of those um, stakeholders, please join our virtual forums. Um, and, and again, that'll be a series that will continue throughout the year. Um, and finally, we have our statewide survey. This is really important because it is the primary vehicle we'll use for collecting quantitative data during the planning process. So we have a lot of different qualitative opportunities, um, but this is really the key um, the link uh, you'll see is, is right there, bit.ly slash connect all hyphen survey. Um, we have kiosks in the cafe that you can use to um, complete the survey today. Um, we also would love for you to share the survey link widely with anyone you encounter. We know you all represent some really, really important constituents. Um, and there's, you know, there's little postcards that you can take with the QR code. Please um, share those widely. And the, the survey closes on June 30th. So you have just over two weeks to get um, your survey in, and please, please make sure you do so. All right, next slide. Okay, so here's what we're here to do today. So first, we're gonna give you a taste of the robust and diverse um, digital equity ecosystem that we have here in the city. And then it'll really be time uh, to hear from you. We wanna gather input from you to build the collective vision of digital equity in, um, in New York. So that includes access, affordability, quality, choice, and safety. Um, like I spoke about, but it could also include other values, um, other important programs, and that's what we want to surface today. Um, we're gonna ask you about the challenges and barriers, like I said, um, but we also wanna hear about what your priorities are for uh, improving accessibility, for improving affordability, and um, we wanna know what's working again. Um, so please uh, be vocal and, um, and, and give some shine to the programs that are working here. We know that uh, Harlem has a wonderful ecosystem and we have a lot of representatives from across the city um, and we wanna hear from you. Um, okay, and finally, here is the timeline to give you a sense of what we'll be up, through, uh, up to through the end of the year. Um, so we are working on the draft plan right now. So you'll see where we are today, kind of in the middle of that line. Um, and all of the engagement that I talked about will continue through the summer at which point we will have a draft plan and we'll come back out and, and share it with you to show you where your input landed in the plan. Um, we'll refine that plan throughout the fall and then um, 
with your feedback, we'll, we will submit that plan, the final version um, at the end of the year. And hopefully uh, with Wendy and Jody as blessing, we will sail into implementation at the beginning of 2024. So it's, uh, it might seem long for you. It seems extremely short to me, um, but uh, we don't actually have the money um, in hand yet. And that's why we really need uh, your input in the planning process. Um, so just to say, um, again, just, I know I've said this, um, but we're focusing on the needs of those who have been most impacted by the barriers uh, to full participation in the digital world. So those are the groups I laid out before. That's the priority here today. If you belong to um, another group, we will um, have an opportunity to hear from you. Um, and just to reiterate, we're aiming not just to increase internet access in New York, but also to unlock all the opportunities that come with that. So it's not just about access today. It's really about the full suite of services um, and needs that create, that can actually realize digital equity. Um, to be clear, again, we are building from the work that many of you have done for years and in some cases decades. Um, and we're so grateful to be building from that strong foundation. Uh, Wendy said it, so I'm allowed to say it, which is New York's plan has to be the best, right? We are New York. We're New Yorkers. We have to do the best job. Um, and, and we're really, really lucky to be building from the foundation that you all have created for us. But we're also really excited um, for anybody that's new to this work because we need your energy and ideas. So we need both that expertise. We need the new energy. Um, and we're really, really thankful to have you all here today and um, hopefully along with us through um, the rest of the planning process and uh, once we finally have the money to spend. So um, that's all. Again, please take the survey um, and there's our email. We're, we're available to chat. Thanks a lot. Well done, Tanaya. Where do we get those slides? All right, all right. That was intense. Um, so we have one more speaker, maybe more, but we definitely have another speaker. Um, a good friend of mine also for many years. I see you, Brett, uh, and I'm glad to see you. Brett Sykoff is here, Executive Director, Franchise Administration for New York City's OTI. Uh, everybody know what OTI stands for? Zero, Brett. <laughs> uh, well, I'll let him explain it. Brett Seacloff serves as the executive director of the Franchise Administration Division within NYC OTI. OTI's Franchise Administration Division manages franchise agreements with private telecommunications companies authorized to use city rights of way to provide cable television, public communication structures, mobile telecommunication, and information services to New Yorkers. Brett oversees dozens of franchise agreements and coordinates closely with franchisees, other agencies, elected officials, and members of the public with a mission to ensure that telecommunication service, services are being offered both efficiently and equitably to all New Yorkers. I wanted to read every single word of that because it's so important that we have to understand what her job is. Maybe I didn't say it well enough for you to get it, but he has a lot of strength on the infrastructure of our city. You guys getting what I'm saying? When we're looking at fiber being deployed, other types of things that are attaching to devices and poles and everything around our, our city, Brett has his hands on all of that. Come on up here, Brett Sykoff. Afternoon, everybody. So many familiar faces and, and amazing leaders in, in this room and just humbled to be in the same room with you all. So uh, great to see you all. As Mr. Banks said, I am Brett Sykoff, Executive Director of Franchise Administration and Broadband with the Office of Technology and Innovation. It is my great pleasure to join you today at the Harlem School of Arts of the Arts to discuss digital equity, an issue that is at the heart of my work at OTI and one that is critical to New York City's present and future. I also want to acknowledge and say hello to my fellow speakers and, of course, our Master of Ceremonies and the OG himself, Mr. Clayton Banks. When Mayor Adams consolidated the city's tech agencies into OTI in January 2022, he declared a bold new vision for ending the decades-long digital divide. 
one that meets historically underserved New Yorkers where they are. In the next few minutes, I'll outline how OTI is delivering on the mayor's promise with the cornerstone digital equity efforts, which include providing 300,000 NYCHA residents with free in-home internet and basic cable TV in just nine months via the Big Apple Connect program, 300,000. Building 90% of our Link 5G kiosks in equity districts to create nodes of connectivity that offer free Wi-Fi, better cell phone service, and free calling. And creating an ecosystem of digital literacy training and accessible devices through our Connected Communities program, which you'll hear about more in the next panel with my colleague, Megan McDermott. We approach our digital equity efforts with urgency because this is an urgent issue for students, job seekers, families, older adults who are on the wrong side of the digital divide. As the pandemic made painfully obvious, access to dependable, high-speed internet is not a luxury. It is an essential component to fully participating in our modern society. At the beginning of the pandemic, hundreds of thousands of New York City school students were sent home with tablets. Those students who, in particular, lived in NYCHA buildings without access to internet through no fault of their own, fell behind their peers. Without quality and reliable internet access, our city's lower income families struggle during the lockdown to find employment, schedule and attend telemedicine appointments, and just stay in touch with loved ones. As Mayor Adams entered office, the cost of inaction had already exerted a steep price on our neighbors living in public housing. We had to act, and so we did. Thanks to the leadership of the mayor, and of course, my boss, the Chief Technology Officer, Matthew Frazier, OTI took concrete steps to ensure that our fellow New Yorkers possessed affordable high-speed internet. In September 2022, we launched Big Apple Connect, the nation's largest municipal broadband program and 135 developments across the city. At the time, Mayor Adams promised to expand the program to 300,000 residents by the end of 2023. We surpassed that goal this March, nine months ahead of schedule. Today, we proudly offer services to residents at 202 developments, including Queensbridge, the nation's largest public housing development, and Bayview Houses in Canarsie, where I was born and raised, Senator Parker. Um, Big Apple Connect's impact and the need for the program can be seen through two statistics. We have, supported, uh, we have surpassed 100,000 household enrollments in less than one year. 100,000 households in less than one year now have high-speed internet access. Seventy-five percent of eligible New York City Housing Authority residents have access to high-speed internet now. Seventy-five percent. We designed Big Apple Connect to go hand-in-hand -hand with the ACP program so that lower-income public housing residents don't have to choose between make internet and, and cell service on which to save. They can receive free internet through Big Apple Connect and apply their ACP credit towards their cell phone bill. This ensures that hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers don't have to make an either or decision regarding these modern necessities because of cost. Affordable broadband is a key plank to our efforts to bridge the digital divide. It is not the only plank, however. We realize that even today in 2023, the sole means of going online for many people is through their phone. For this reason, our Link NYC program remains an invaluable resource for New Yorkers and visitors as evidenced by its 13 million Wi-Fi users and 5 million annual phone calls. In 2022, Mayor Adams launched the latest version of Link NYC, Link 5G, which will expand ultra-fast wireless coverage in addition to providing free phone calls, Wi-Fi, and access to 911. Link 5G's rollout is equity-centered, meaning 90% of new installations will be above 96th Street in Manhattan and in the outer boroughs. Our goal is to ensure that New Yorkers are able to stay connected wherever they live, work, or travel across the city. The Link NYC program also laid the foundation over the past year and a half for the launch of Gigabit Innovation Centers in each of the five boroughs, the first of which originated with Lightning Banks, Silicon Harlem. The Gigabit Centers provide access to free internet, devices, digital skills training to everyone from middle school students learning to design new apps, to immigrant workers seeking a better life for their families in Staten Island. Digital literacy cannot be underestimated when we discuss digital equity, however. 
That's why we, pro we proudly fund and administer connected communities, a partnership with the Parks Department, NYC Aging, NYCHA, and the city's library systems that delivers high quality digital education for New Yorkers most in need. From helping older adults acquire new computer skills to supporting roving computer labs with Wi-Fi connectivity, Connected Communities is offering New Yorkers easy access to the life-changing opportunities technology avails. As we expand our digital equity offerings to New Yorkers, OTI wants to help augment growth among local businesses in the technology space. We look forward to exploring new partnership opportunities with community-based groups who share our commitment to bridge the digital divide. We will be in touch on those opportunities in the coming months. For now, though, we're here to listen to you and come up with ideas on the best way to deliver digital equity to every corner of this great city. Thank you. Hope you all have a great evening. I'm looking forward to hearing from you all. Whoa, there's a lot of talking here. Um, if you guys don't mind, we'd, we're gonna move on to our very first panel. You see these chairs and these microphones. We're gonna set up a panel here to talk. I would suggest that you stretch a little bit for a couple of minutes <laughs> while we get the team up here. So feel free to uh, stretch up a little bit, but I'm gonna call the folks up to the panel number one. Thanks for a prior, um, so, say something? Oh, okay, so anyway, hopefully you got a lot out of the first uh, several people speaking. Thank you, Hope Knight, thank you so much. This is our moment, everybody. This is our moment. Take a minute. Okay, everyone. Thank you very much for being patient. But look up here. Look what's happening here. There's people here. That means they have something to say, or at least something, something, maybe something just to listen. Who knows? But it's the, the key to digital equity ecosystems, trusted community anchors. That's sort of the title in some ways. So what we're looking at is, uh, is this correctly? Why here? Access, affordability, and adoption via. Oh, you want to do this part now? Go for it. Uh, but can I at least say their names? You, you, um, you know what? Here's our moderator. I'm going to have her take care of the panel. Is that okay? I can go get some coffee. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, at least, can I introduce you? Do I have a whole thing about you here no, somewhere? Just my name's great. We gotta, we gotta, we're gonna knock it out. Yeah. Okay, I'm not gonna even do that then. You get the movie. You go ahead, take it over. I'm gonna go sit down. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. First of all, Clayton, thank you so much for your patience and your kindness and your generosity. Uh, very, we're, okay, we're about to move this really quickly because we wanna make sure that you get to hear from folks about what solutions can look like. My name is Megan McDermott, Director of Digital Inclusion and Partnerships with OTI. Do I need to stand back? Sure. Okay. Usually, usually I like to be in front of people, not behind this thing, so excuse me. Um, the thing I wanna impress upon all of you is that the opportunity before us is to hear from practitioners on the ground. So we've heard a lot about digital equity, and the question is, what is it? So Tanaya gave us some expansive room to think about it in terms of what this historic moment means for funding. But I just wanna share with you that the opportunity here is to also think about partnership and collaborations. What does it mean to actually create digital equity as an ecosystem? So I just wanna, um, Clayton took, okay, here's my paper. So here's the thing. The Digital Equity Research Center at Metro Council has a really beautiful description of what digital equity means when people are in partnership with each other, when you're in community together in order to affect certain kinds of outcomes. So we heard about the five issue areas, but within that there's, connect there's connection, right? There's what communities need. So what I wanted to really say, the, the ultimate purpose here is that there's a secret that's about to be shared, all of which you as practitioners know, which is that without trust, without community organizations, none of this work is actually possible. 
So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to each of these folks who are gonna introduce themselves and speak very directly to the solutions that we're looking for because they are in community. They're not just sitting at a policy desk, right? We're not, they're not far away. They're actually engaged and learning with people as to what the needs are. When this money comes down, as Tanaya said, it really needs to be used for the service of communities, community outcomes, and community determination. And that's ultimately what we're talking about. It's not just about digital, it's actually about equity. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to David Giles. And, okay, this is on. Um, my name is David Giles. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer of Brooklyn Public Library. Um, the Brooklyn Public Library has 62 locations in the borough. Uh, every neighborhood in Brooklyn has a public library branch. Um, and I guess the first thing to say about this issue um, for us and in Brooklyn is that the pandemic fundamentally altered and transformed the way that we go about helping people uh, with digital related issues and problems. Um, we've been offering digital literacy programs for many years, decades. Um, they've been enrichment programs for every age group, uh, every demographic uh, in Brooklyn. Um, but since the pandemic, um, since we were closed for several months in 2020, um, and then partially closed even through parts of 2021, um, and when we saw people um, lined up outside of Brooklyn Public Library branches, um, getting the, the Wi-Fi bleeding through the windows, we realized how critical uh, it was for us um, to help people get connected to the internet. So broadband equity um, and not just digital literacy became a big issue for us. Um, in 2020, we started raising private funds to erect Wi-Fi antennas on every single library branch in Brooklyn so that now every branch has a Wi-Fi antenna that projects Wi-Fi uh, deeper into the community. Um, we bought uh, street furniture um, and worked with the DOT to start setting up outdoor libraries during the pandemic. And these continue, even though our doors are open now and people use them. Um, and we also, when the EBB came, came rolling out, um, I believe in, was, was it 2021, um, we started um, getting into the business of helping people sign up for broadband subsidies. Um, and at that time, we set up computer stations uh, for people to access the EBB application online. Um, and and we've, we've deepened that um, in the last uh, year and a half or so with the ACP, the Affordable Connectivity Program. Um, so this last fall, we launched a digital navigation program. Um, we're calling it the Home Internet Access Program um, that basically walks uh, Brooklynites through the process of applying for the Affordable Connectivity Program. Um, which is an onerous process for many people. For many people, um, it's fine. Um, if you're on SSI or if you're on SNAP, um, in many cases, the, the system will verify uh, that you qualify and give you a confirmation number pretty quickly. For many people, it's much more complicated than that. So we have computer stations up uh, in the branches and we have navigators who help people upload their IDs into the USAG system um, upload their enrollment letters or report cards from their DOE school into the, into the system. Um, in some cases, we have to call USAC and ask what the issues are for people um, when, when it's asking for more information. Um, we've opened a hotline um, for anybody to, to call to ask questions um, about the USAC, I mean, about the ACP benefit. Um, so this has become a big issue. Broadband equity has become an issue that for us that it hasn't um, been in the past. Um, and then one, one more thing um, I'd like to say about uh, the pandemic um, is um, for us, since, since the pandemic, um, since we're, we're grappling with the, still grappling with the immense results uh, of the pandemic and the need people have to get online and access services online, we started referencing a distinction um, in the kinds of support that we provide to people in Brooklyn. Um, and I guess one, one way to talk about that is we, we live in the age of compulsory computing. Um, so we've served people who uh, are motivated to learn um, and, to, and to gain more skills, digital literacy skills, um, people who want to make themselves more marketable um, on, on the, in, the, in the jobs marketplace. 
um, people who want to learn more or just interested in learning more about robotics or digital media or, you know, Zoom or any of these things. We've served those people pretty well. Um, but more and more, um, we're, we're having people come in to, to libraries and basically they want task-oriented support. Um, they have a problem right now that they need help with, right? So these are folks that aren't always um, wanting to sign up for a program um, and they need help now. And, and we're, you know, every library across the city, really, um, any branch that's open is every day fielding these sorts of questions. Um, and so it's important, um, I have 30 seconds left, it's important that the doors of the library are open, that our, our branches are staffed, um, and that these people are, are available for our neighbors um, to, to ask these sorts of questions and get this kind of support every day. So with that, I will, I will pass the mic. Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jin Hyun Bae. I am Digital Literacy Coordinator at Queen's Public Library. And I'm so grateful to be here to see um, so many familiar faces that I haven't seen since before the pandemic, as well as new faces. It's always a good sign when you see new faces. That means that the movement is building and that there's more and more interest in the work that we are doing. So Queen's Public Library serves um, 2.5 million people living in Queen's. We have 66 locations and we serve everyone who walks through our doors, who connects to our internet, who comes to our virtual programming. And um, I won't go too much into what uh, David has mentioned. We do all of these things um, that support um, our customers, our job, the way we see it, is to maximize, help people maximize the resources that they have available to them, to really find a new job if that's what they want to do, to learn a new language, learn the English, whatever skills they need to do, to really foster a positive connection with lifelong learning. And um, just to highlight a few programs that we have um, happening right now, we have Queens Connected, which is a program that in a slightly different way is attempting to bridge the digital divide and specifically broadband access. We have thousands of Wi-Fi hotspots that, that are being loaned out at 25 locations that have been selected based on um, broadband adoption rates, uh, device availability uh, in households, as well as um, other factors such as whether their location is near NYCHA housing. In addition to that, within Queens Connected, we um, have laptops to loan and that is expanding as well. Um, one thing I'd like to say around that, just a number Hopefully that will give you a sense of what, um, how this is really important for a lot of people is that we have around 3,000 hotspots. That's not that many. And there is a real demand for it. I get, um, I think the numbers currently, circulation numbers, including the lending as well as renewals, currently it's close to 9,000. So 9,000 times people have borrowed or renewed hotspots. And with the addition of laptops, we're going to see that number increase as well. Um, the numbers you might think are low, but um, or high, depending on where your anchor is. But I can tell you that it is pretty high just because the way that we have this set up is people can borrow hotspots for two months and then have up to optional five times renewal, allowing them to keep the hotspot for up to a year. Um, another example to think of it, just kind of to help you picture how libraries are really important in terms of in the ecosystem and you know how we are a good access point from so many services and things is um, just think about um, a young mother who wants to uh, apply for a job 
and this mother is has a child. They don't have childcare. One thing they can do is come um, come to the library and get the help they need. The child can be entertained by story time um, in the morning. The mother can go to the to the public uh, computing light uh, computing labs and work on their resume. If they're not sure what to put on their resume, or even if they're not sure about how to how to find a job, there are library staff who can help with that. Um, so, and I really want to say that even if you are not a young mother, it is actually pretty hard. I'm pretty sure every one of us has tried to apply for a job or something online. And it is a bit of a trial to do all of those things. So it's worth mentioning again. Um, so I think that's it for me. Pass on to Monica. Thank you, Regine, and thank you, colleagues, for being here, collaborators, and thank you, Connect All in Silicon Harlem for hosting. Um, I'm from Make the Road, New York. We are an immigrant um, and community organizing organization with 25,000 members and offices in Staten Island, Long Island. Queens, Brooklyn, and Westchester, um, and 25,000 members and counting. And uh, many are from immigrant Spanish-speaking communities in Latin America. Um, and uh, we build the power of the immigrant and working class community to achieve dignity and justice. And we do that through organizing. We do that through policy work. And we offer survival services such as the adult literacy classes that we have. And many folks come to our offices for English classes, citizenship classes, help with career pathways and digital literacy classes. But they stay because we have our teachers create the environment where they can be themselves and express themselves um, and other parts of their identity and work together in, in civic engagement. Um, I'm going to focus on the digital equity part of the work. Um, we have also been doing digital equity work, digital literacy for many years, but of course the pandemic was one of those times that we all kind of had to scramble to get, you know, people to take online classes. We had to get people to figure out how to get their appointments for their legal services online, health, um, you know, the health insurance, all of those government services and um, trying to get government services because of your documented status, um, we had to figure all that out. And we did that with the help of our first digital literacy and navigation VISTA member, Denise Camarillo Cruz, who is here. Um, and we uh, recruited a bunch of volunteers um, to help with the task of getting people online and the services that they need. We also ran in 2022 a survey to find out deeper um, about the needs of the community. Um, and we found out that um, I think more than half of people did not have a laptop or a PC. Um, and now a year later, I think the other half were counting their kids' computers that they don't use or they have to give back or they, they just don't know how to use them. We also found out that uh, people lack the basic literacy uh, and even the vocabulary to speak about computers, to help their kids, to get government services, to speak to their immigration lawyers or officers, to and protect to themselves from cyber attacks, which is really, really important. They, they don't even know how to create, uh, update or install an antivirus software. So we have been addressing that with classes. Um, and we have been working with um, organizations to review and test their materials. We have been looking at North Star um, for assessment, um, their Spanish uh, materials. And ultimately we realized that we need to create our own tools to serve the unique um, needs of our very specific community, um, which is very often forgotten. So we, and I mentioned that because as we're designing solutions, I wanna make sure that um, I say this out there. When it comes to digital equity, not one size fits all. There is not one size fits all solution. 
Um, and so we need the space and the funding to expand on our own uh, materials, our own assessments, and to be able to collaborate and share with each other these materials and assessments. Um, we want to continue the work. We want to expand the work. Uh, we uh, want to make sure that we have what we need. We need to create compensated um, internships in the community. We need to hire additional support. We need devices that are working for our communities to teach and to use. Um, we also need the freedom to have very flexible outcomes and also outcomes that are fitting to our community. Again, not one size fits all. Um, we, I want to be clear also, since NTIA is here, we need you to reassure us that, that if I refer a person to you, to the ACP program, that their information is not going to be shared with anti-immigrant agencies such as ICE. Okay? That said, I, thank you. I, that said, I hope that this is really truly shaping the conversation and that a substantial amount of money goes towards um, digital literacy and navigation programs as opposed to primarily on internet um, access, which is also really important. Uh, but our needs are also, their needs are significant, not one size fits all. Thank you so much, everyone. I look forward to passing it off. Thank you, Monica. And thank you for stealing my talking point because I was going to start with that one size doesn't fit all. Um, no, this is perfect. Thank you. So it, um, thank you to the folks that organized the event. Thank you, Jolie, for organizing all the tech and keeping us all communicating effectively, which is magnificent. Um, my name is Tom Camber. I'm the executive director of Older Adults Technology Services. Most people call us OATS, and we're affiliated with AARP, so now we're OATS from AARP. And we run all these uh, free programs for older adults around the country. They're called Senior Planet, so you may have heard of us as Senior Planet. It occurs to me sitting in this chair that I've been doing this work now for 30 years, and um, which is crazy, right? Uh, when I was in my like 24 years old, I worked on a project called the Technology Opportunities Program, which was from Commerce, and they funded, they didn't have, nobody had the internet at home, so they funded um, community technology centers. There was one here in Harlem uh, called Playing to Win, some people may recall. Uh, Rasan uh, Harris, who was their director, is still working in the, in, in the nonprofit sector here. And I remember wiring uh, low-income housing co-ops up here in Harlem for um, computers in the, in the uh, tenants association offices, and they were funded by Commerce, and we were trying to get people online. So there's this kind of early era of community technology centers. There's a whole movement around it, and that sort of evolved into a second generation, which happened with the BTOP program, which is Broadband Technology Opportunities Program. Wendy knows that one well. A lot of folks in this room worked on that program, and um, Oates was uh, fortunate enough to receive a grant through the, what they call BTOP program. And I had started Oates in 2004, uh, really trying to ch get, get at that challenge of what's going on with older adults who are having such a hard time with technology, and how do we build programs that can help them overcome those barriers and get online? And back then, it was in Bedford-Stuyvesant, that was our first site, the Shabazz Complex on Gates Avenue, and I sat with the Tenants Association, Association directors and said, what do we need to do to get people online? What's, what, what, you know, what kind of training, uh, what kind of support, what kind of devices do you want to use? And people helped me write a curriculum, which today everybody would call co-design, uh, but back then we didn't have fancy terms, it was just like people with a notebook. Um, but we wrote the first uh, senior focused tech uh, training that was built with older adults in mind and started teaching it in first in Brooklyn and then up here in Harlem we were at the um, at the uh, uh, over here at um, Carnetta Clark was working with us in West Harlem now we're over here at a Philip Randolph for those of you who know that in this neighborhood uh, one of the best sites that we have in the whole country and we built this program this training for older adults one size does not fits all to fit all it turns out if you work with constituencies everybody has a lens or a point of view into the technology. So what we learned just organically was if you work with people and you design a program that's perfectly tuned to what they need, it will evolve, but it can really help you build up some momentum. And so OATS started at that one location. Soon enough, we were at about 10 or 15 locations. When BTOP happened, we started our first ever center, the Senior Planet Center, which is still running on 25th Street today. Uh, it's part of the Connected Communities program that was referenced earlier. And we have been providing our programs free of charge for older adults since day one. Uh, this last year, we taught 350,000 people how to use technology around the country. 
And I will say that New York is the home and the epicenter of all this stuff. It's where all the real action is. And everywhere I go, people are like, what's going on in New York? They gave away all these tablets and NYCHA and they're doing all this cool stuff with, you know, Make the Road and these different programs, the library systems, like leaps ahead of where a lot of place, places are. So they're looking to learn from us and get some of our, we're kind of a beacon of innovation around this stuff. And it's been really amazing. John Paul Farmer's here now, uh, who helped us with the project when, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll finish up real quick because I know we're running low on time here. But when we, when COVID happened, the mayor's office called up and said, we want to give away 10,000 tablets in the housing uh, to, to residents of public housing. Uh, how many people can we train? We put together a program and we launched for us the first ever online training program, which we'd never done before. We were up, up all night trying to figure out how do you do a call center? People were getting boxes at their door and they were like, what is in this box? And then we would call them that day and say, did you get a box? And they'd say, yeah, we'd open it up and we would talk them through unboxing, you know, push this button, it should turn on. And then uh, we offered people training. We were able to work with all 10,000 people, but only 2,500 of them took the training, which is fine, right? Some people have their, their, their family members, they already know some things. What we got from the 25% though was we had a control group. So we brought in Cornell University and we studied the impact of what we were doing. And that kind of brings me to what this stage three is, which is now we're in the, this sort of new era of broadband uh, inclusion and digital inclusion work. These, these organizations that have expertise with constituencies, immigrants, um, ex-offenders, LGBT folks, um, younger people who may be looking for homework help, senior citizens, each of those organizations, those constituencies now has mature, engaged partners that are developing strategies. And so we were working with the city to learn what comes of these trainings. We found that if people take a class and they get online, they are they are twice as likely to make a new friend and twice as likely to build their social networks than folks that didn't take a class. Well, that's kind of a big deal, right? How much do you, how, how much do you value a friend or a, a, a build, building up new contact, especially for older people who their priority is often how do you rebuild your social network? So we're working with the state now as one of the, as the regional partner, I guess, helping with the, the listening sessions here in New York. We're also part of ARP, so we're actually using these models around the country to have digital inclusion programs that include older adults. We partner with other nonprofits, with libraries. We have 260 partners around the country. And we partner a lot with the, the private sector groups, with the Verizons and the T-Mobiles, and, and those, uh, they're critical resources as we try to solve these problems. So uh, looking for your suggestions, your ideas, and happy to share today, and also super honored to be sharing this panel. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is TJ Woods and I have the pleasure of serving as the Associate Director of Technology Training Programs for the New York Public Library. We are also known as Tech Connect. Thanks, well, it was such a warm room. Family in the house. Uh, we have 88 branches that we serve over 100 class topics. We offer classes in person and online in Mandarin, English, and Spanish. Classes start at 10.30 a.m. They end at 8 p.m. and we offer them six days a week. It is love that we serve every day. We have studios in Manhattan and in the Bronx. We wanna make sure people are able to tell their story. It's so important when you think about the unhoused and wanting to get involved civically, but productively, we create a space for that, a space for community. We have lovely events like the tech fair where people get to be exposed to emerging technology. They come in, they're looking for careers. They can be pushed into our career services department, our social workers. We have so many cool things at the library. I was very surprised when I joined the team. This work can't be done without accurate uh, assessments and funding from the community. So we bring people in to have focus groups. We wanna know what they need next. When you think about prohibitively expensive software, like Adobe Creative Cloud, it's $1,000, right? How do we make sure people have access to that so that there aren't two tiers of creatives out there, especially in New York, where you can really make good money, right? So we have computers set out where people can renew their time there indefinitely, as long as no one else has a reservation on it, and then they get to produce what they like from the studio. It's an editing bay, come see us, right? We're doing really transformative work and I'm excited for all the new things we'll get to do in the future. Um, and I'm here today to just troubleshoot and share more about the good stuff that we got going on. Megan? So I know we ran out of time and initially we were gonna have a conversation and questions with you all, but the point is 
you heard from folks who are the leading edge, the ground game, the community partners. And so critically, the takeaway here is that for New York State, as you're thinking about the digital equity plan, the expertise is in the room and it's in our neighbors, it's in our communities, it's with the folks here, the solutions are here, the relationships are here. So just so humbled to be with you in this work and really appreciate you taking time to be with us today. Thank all of you. Thank you, Megan. Now get off my stage. No, I was just kidding. Uh, we have a great, great opportunity right now to one of the great electives in our city. Uh, previous was the Manhattan Borough President. Anybody know who that was? Let's bring her up. Gail Brewer, come on up here. Say a few words, if you don't mind. Right after Gail, we're going to be talking about the lightning talks. Right after Gail, we're doing the lightning talks. My favorite person of all time. Thank you very much. I was there when Silicon Harlem started, and so I'm a big fan, and it's really wonderful to see you, and I don't know half as much as what you know in the audience. But a um, couple of things, just in terms of how I see uh, current, and obviously there's so much history here, but we all want connectivity, municipal Wi-Fi available for everyone. That's the goal. I remember we used to try to do it you know, in the 90s, 2000s, and we had three or four false starts, and we still don't have it. I do not think that putting 5G kiosks everywhere or Link NYC gets us very far. I used to joke and said, do I need to uh, have a contract for the sofa or the chair that would sit next to it? Because it's just not what I consider uh, citywide municipal free Wi-Fi. It, and half of my community doesn't want those goddamn 5G tall things in their neighborhoods. So, okay, but that's not it. Um, I do think that the panel that you just heard from Oates and the library and the nonprofit organizations is really the way to go, where you have people locally in the community working on municipal Wi-Fi. NYCHA has, under this mayor, um, worked with, particularly with Spectrum. Um, I do know people, and there are people in the room who know that if you have this Apple program or whatever the hell it's called, then you can get pretty good dollar on Spectrum. If you have Fios, understandably, for whatever reason, uh, the folks at Verizon don't want to do it. So I don't know if it's working. There are people who I know who have Spectrum and they love it, but I don't know how well it's publicized and I don't know if it works. And there are lots of, always a challenge with everything. I do say from the pandemic, um, when I talk to doctors in the community who are really working in the community, um, telehealth is what changed everything. So whether it's telehealth for seniors, telehealth for families, and so it's one more reason that we absolutely have to have the kind of connectivity that is real and not made up. So it's, that's important. And the schools, I can tell you, despite, you know, every five years you need all new equipment, um, it mostly comes from the city council or others that are working on what we call Reso A. It doesn't happen every five years. The schools are, in many cases, way behind unless they're a parents association or special grants that the principals are smart enough to get. So don't think that the schools all have great technology because they don't. And of course, with the seniors, OATS is the key to everything. I know that the city council's technology committee did pass some bills that talk about having navigators and support in the community. But if I had my way, I would have funding at 311 so that if a senior calls 311 and he or she cannot figure out what to do, 311 would help them and you or Oaks would be on the other end of the line, not 311. But that hasn't happened. That's what I asked. It has not happened. But that's what we want uh, for the seniors. I will also say in terms of the libraries and the schools, my understanding is the folks in Washington, the FCC, won't do it, although it is still being discussed. I went to Washington, I testified years ago, I was told no. E-rate to bleed out into the neighborhood. Because then if E-rate bleeds out into the neighborhood, then you, well, small businesses and others, residents could get that kind of support. That would be really important. Something interesting about the asylums. I'm in all the hotels. I go constantly, uh, both to the Hercs and the DHSs. Not one person has asked for a phone. The city seems to have a million phones. I don't know, they seem to have them in the warehouse or something. 
Not one person has asked for them. Every single person who is coming across the border or in a plane has a phone. And so, and they're using it for translation as well as for the other aspects of trying to figure out the world of New York City, whether it's jobs or uh, benefits, you know, everything is legal or illegal. As the mayor said, I said, I don't care whether they get a legal or illegal job. And the mayor said, I agree with Gail Brewer. Um, the other issue, of course, is just how do you deal with the small businesses in general? It was very interesting during the pandemic. I was borough president. The downtown bids, send out an email, everybody got it. The uptown, you had to go door to door to door to get information that was so important to their survival. So we still have a huge digital divide. We have a big language issue. Um, every single day there's a new manager and often speaking many different languages, so we are not completely uh, technology savvy in terms of the businesses. I will also say, and I don't know if Al Leidner is here, but he's one of my heroes also. He and um, his partner, Wendy, are doing the amazing underground work, as I call it. They, there are people here who know more about it than I do, but basically he has a grant from the feds to working with NYU. They're gonna be doing what we dreamed about for years, which is to know what the hell is under the streets. And then that will help us figure out what should be above the streets. Um, it's been something that's been worked on for 20, 25 years. It is happening. And if Al Leidner is doing it, Wendy's doing it, you know it's going to go well. Um, we're also concerned about facial recognition. I'm not a big fan of facial recognition. Maybe there are people in the room who are. But the low-income communities call me because it doesn't work. Um, there's differences as to who gets profiled and who doesn't, et cetera. So I would say just be very, very careful of supporting uh, facial recognition. I'm interested in what happens with the franchise agreements. People don't understand that, uh, you know, as time comes up, Verizon, Spectrum, et cetera, they have to work with the city when they go underground. And, you know, since nobody's doing cable, I have a television. I bet nobody else here has a television. I'm the only one in the room with a television. But um, when you have no televisions, then this franchise agreement, which is based on the subscriptions to the cable, that's not going to go too well in terms of the money. The city relies on it, Manhattan Neighborhood Network, and the other public access channels. I love those public access channels. I want them to survive. Something to think about in terms of the community. I know their lawyers are here. And then just finally, um, I am the author of the Open Data Bill. I think that it works, and you know, Beta NYC translated for us. Thank you, Noel and company. But I would say that um, you know we still have to work on that, both for uh, making sure that it's up to date and that it's easy to read, because Beta NYC helps, but it should be a little bit more available to people. And we're all trying to use all of this technology to make sure that schools, jobs, healthcare, seniors, families, low income, NYCHA, have access, and it's really a challenge. We've been working on it, it's getting better. But without you and Silicon Harlem, we'd be nowhere. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gail Brewer, an awesome, awesome person for our beautiful city here. Um, I definitely want to acknowledge the fact that we're moving right into the lightning round. Um, Josh, are you going to come up here and, and navigate that? So we're going to do that. Right after that, we're doing the breakouts and food. Somebody heard that, right? Food is coming up. So we got that coming up as well. So, Josh? Uh, okay, so uh, we're going to keep it moving. Um, the lightning round, I'm going to ask all of our ISP partners uh, so we can move quickly to come over to this side of the room. Um, uh, we have an order that we're going to go in. Um, I think um, I think we used a, a very complicated uh, AI-powered algorithm to select the order. Tonight, we pulled pulled from a hat, right? That was the way we did it. Um, but I want to say, um, really appreciate uh, all of these um, internet service providers that are working to bring internet service to New Yorkers in a variety of ways. Uh, being here today. Um, and all the work they do every single day in uh, across the city. Um, we, we gave them, you know, it's going to be three minutes each, and we're going to move it quickly, but here's the thing that, that I want to say about this and, and what we talked and planned with them. They're not here to sell a product, right? 
the, the goal of, of what they're talking about is how they approach partnerships, because ultimately when we're getting people online, that's what it's going to take. It's going to take partnerships. So each one of them is going to talk about how they, uh, how they approach, uh, you know, that, that kind of work. Um, I will, uh, run the timer to try and, uh, again, keep it moving. Um, and ask them to, to come up to the stage uh, in order. And again, um, just really appreciate um, you know, each one of them being here today. And I'm, I'm just gonna say that their company name and allow them to introduce themselves and the work that they do and how they approach the, the potential for partnerships. Uh, let's start with Starry. Vertically challenged. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Madeline St. Ange. I'm the Director of Government Affairs and Strategic Advancement at Starry. For those of you who may not be familiar with us, we are an internet service provider who operates across New York City, um, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx. Um, we're also available across um, four other markets in the United States. That includes Boston, um, DC, Denver, and um, Los Angeles. Um, overall, just a quick overview on the com company and I can take a look at the slide up there too. Um, we're found on the belief that everyone deserves access to affordable and high quality internet no matter where they live. Um, our goal is to delight our customers and we do this through things like offering simple and transparent pricing and high speed plans, unlimited data, and excellent 24 seven customer support for all of our subscribers. Uh, we launched our service in uh, New York City in 2018. Um, and that same year, we also launched our digital equity program, Sorry Connect which offers a ultra low cost, low barrier um, broadband option specifically for families living in public and affordable housing communities. Um, when we kind of started to shape this program, we saw that in our urban areas, primarily where we're providing service, the digital divide disproportionately affected families primarily living in subsidized housing. So we intentionally focused our program on serving that portion of the population to have the greatest impact. Um, instead of, um, Instead of, part, um, instead of requiring residents to go through individual el eligibility requirements to qualify for our low cost plan, we just partner directly with public and affordable housing owners to offer it across their entire community. Um, and kind of that's, I think that's really important just in terms of how we build trust across these communities. It's really about breaking down some of those barriers that traditionally um, prevented them from getting gaining access in the past. Um, the majority of these communities that we work in are very are either they range from low low uh, to middle income communities and and the spectrum of things that residents are um, worried about home broadband can often be pretty low on the list when you're thinking about things that they deal with like um, food insecurity, health and safety issues, financial insecurity, and a myriad, myriad of other challenges. And you know, of course, broadband can be a great asset to helping with those um, challenges. It's often, um, if it's too difficult to gain affordable access, it often falls by the wayside. Um, so really that's kind of our first layer in terms of dealing with how to build trust across these communities. And then the second piece is just really putting in the work. Um, our team makes it a, uh, if you can go to the next slide, kind of highlight some of this work, but our team makes it a priority to forge very strong relationships with all of our public housing and affordable housing partners. Um, from the property ownership to the tenant leadership to each resident in the community. Um, we're a very collaborative and engaged um, partner. And in many cases, um, you could say that sorry, a sorry employee is a friendly face and friendly and familiar face to, in these communities. Um, it's also how we identify other ways that we can support these communities. Um, you'll see there that we've done initiatives like um, hosting back to school drives, um, doing food drives, um, you know, sponsoring scholarship dinners. Um, and partnering with other organizations like Microsoft and everyone on to support device access and digital literacy and um, education sessions within these communities. So I think that, that um, our kind of whole community approach to working across these communities is really important and help building that trust and that trust um, helps increase broadband adoption and adoption of uh, government programs like the ACP. So that's um, sort of the linchpin of how we approach our work across our um, public and affordable housing communities that we serve. And with that, I'll have the real next one. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Maddie. Again, you know, that, they give, um, that's the, the qualification for having the job of running the Connect All programs, being willing to, 
you know, move, move ISPs uh, along, but there's uh, so much, so much to share. Uh, let's go to People's Choice Communications. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for allowing me a chance to speak. Thank you, Mr. Banks, also for giving me the invitation. So our company, to briefly go over it, we are a group of IBEW Local 3 members, uh, worked for the cable company Time Warner Cable before Spectrum took over. Um, when Spectrum took over, the workforce ended up going on strike. So the striking workers figured we'd have to do something different to try to turn things around, so we decided to come up with a plan. As union members do, we banded together and we put together a business plan. The business plan was to have a municipal option where the city could own the cable system. We presented that to elected officials, they liked the plan, but nobody actually took it and moved forward with it. So you said, you know what, we're union workers, let's go to work. We decided to move forward with the plan anyway. So the next phase was People's Choice Communications. The idea was we already know how to build the system. The customers want something different, so let's join together and rebuild the system we built again, this time having the workers and the owners, um, workers and the customers as the owners of the system. So um, in doing that, I think it was the 30th of the strike that the pandemic hit more heavily. And now it was highlighted even more of how many people were with, without service. So building out these systems, we were able to start building in the most affected areas, which was public housing, affordable housing, supportive housing. And what picked up and what we were doing were things like Forbes magazine picked up and said um, we were able to provide service cheaper than tap water. The reason we were doing this is because our prices were so low. The emergency broadband benefit at the time, we were able to utilize this and able to provide free service for the residents there and continue to build out on that program, utilizing those funds. The goal of our company is to be able to reinvest the money that people would normally spend on their bills back into the same communities we serve. If we can do that, we can start to create a socioeconomic change where the money coming in is not just a one-time uh, one time effect, it kind of re-energizes and feeds the community back over and over again. So you can look at some of the work that we've done um, throughout large portions of the Bronx, up in Manhattan, if you can go to the next one. Um, we were able to utilize the ACP benefit and create a custom API where we were able to streamline the process and help people get online more smoothly through the process and also give them $11 laptops, a uh, service that's not utilized as often, but we know our people needed it. We will also be able to fast forward one of our programs and hire people from the communities we're serving, creating a digital stewardship program so that people there can actually work in the system that they build and that could kind of start that ecosystem. If you go next. So where we started uh, was from a place where people said that we weren't going to be able to do what we did, and we did it. Where we are now is to try to expand and continue to build and move this forward. As we talk about billions of dollars that are about to come down from the state to feed this, the question is, what are we going to do and how are we going to do this? And the way I see it is, when you're talking about billions of dollars, um, I don't know if everybody ever heard the expression of teach a man to fish. So... Kind of that when you're talking about billions of dollars, you're not really doing a fish, you're doing more like a full lobster dinner. <laughs> so if it's us sitting at the table, I think we understand better of how it is, how it works. We will take that lobster dinner and say, you know what, given money you're gonna do is try lobster dinner, we're gonna go down the block and get some whitens to make sure the entire family can eat because we need to eat. We're gonna take that extra money, we know somebody on the block who used to be a fisherman and get a fisher boat. And with that money, we're gonna make sure everybody can continue eating, use the extra money, and we'll buy a lobster boat. Now the people that have to buy, that buy lobsters all the time, we can feed them and we have enough money that we can make lobster flakes and sprinkle it on all our food if I want. All right. Thank, you, Troy. Thank you so much, everyone. All right. Thank you, Troy. Uh, next, we're gonna hear from Altis. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Connect All. All that lobster talk. I'm a little hungry. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Bresen. I'm Senior Director of Government Affairs at Altice USA. Just a brief background about Altice. Uh, through our, our brand Optimum, we offer video, broadband, mobile services um, to over 1.5 million New York City residents and businesses across Bro Brooklyn and the Bronx. We appreciate the opportunity to speak with you about how Altice, as an ISP, serve in New York City. So we're going to build trust with underserved residents and break down barriers to broadband adoption. 
A central part of ISPs building trust with its customers is understanding and meeting the needs. We have found that customers want to stay continuously connected. They want fast and reliable service. And they want obtaining services to be as seamless as possible. By addressing affordability, forming public-private partnerships, and, and working with community partners, we can address and close gaps in broadband adoption. Affordability is at the center of getting un underserved residents connected to the internet and keeping them connected. Customers experience financial difficulties, will often disconnect their broadband subscription, leaving families without a critical resource. That's why we're part participating in public-private partnerships like Big Apple Connect, which provides residents of NYCHA with free, high-speed broadband. This baseline broadband connection provides NYCHA residents with uninterrupted connectivity. There are, there are many other barriers to other than affordability, however. Making it easy for underserved New Yorkers to get participate in broadband programs is essential. Big Apple Connect streamlines sign up for services, only requiring residents to opt in. We provide on-site installations and a dedicated service line. We also partner with the city to connect family homeless shelters during the pandem pandemic so that students could participate in remote learning. Shelter residents did ne not need to contact us, we provided service directly to 7,000 units at more than 140 New York City family homeless shelters. All of our customers want a fast, reliable service that their families can count on at a great value. Over the past several years, we've been investing in our network with our fiber to, fiber to the home network across New York. This network will deliver symmetrical, multi-gig broadband services to homes and businesses. We're, we recognize the need to provide high-speed broadband to meet the gen next generation's needs. We understand that closing the digital divide requires a holistic approach using the synergy of government, ISPs, and community organizations to effectively get residents connected and to remain connected. We have partnerships with community organizations across our footprint who have established trust with residents to provide digital literacy resources and broadband assistance. As Connect All develops their digital equity plan, we encourage funding to support public-private partnerships like Big Apple Connect across the state, as well as funding for trusted community partners that provide digital navigator services and digital literacy services to eligible populations. Again, we appreciate the opportunity to participate in today's listening session and look forward to continuing to collaborate. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, and now we'll hear from Exchange. Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Uh, you see Skywire up there. You're going to be the first to see our new logo. Uh, Exchange Telecom, I'm Doug Turtz, I'm the CEO, has been around in New York for 20 years. And we think about things, I think, a little bit differently from the perspective of infrastructure and coverage. We are very much a local company. Our executives are here, our call centers are here, our staging is here. When we go out into community, we reach out to local leaders, to the community leaders, and we wanna partner side by side with them to figure out where those gaps exist. We wanna to talk to New York City and talk to the residents about where the missing areas of connectivity are, and we wanna fill them in. We then of course have all the programs like ACP where we do staging, training, have people that speak multiple languages in our call centers with our headquarters in Brooklyn, new office that we're opening in Manhattan as we continue to expand out in the footprint here. We have 25,000 residents. And if you look back to the history of 2002 when Exchange started, it was predicated on underserved and digital deserts. We don't like to say digital deserts anymore because we do think there's some level of connectivity with the great people that are here talking to you tonight. But the question is, how do you make it even stronger? So we look at these zones, we use a lot of combination of fiber and fixed wireless to bring connectivity as far out, as fast out, and as reliably out to our constituents and to our uh, users of our service. In doing so, we believe that this is the kind of connectivity that can be turned up very quickly. The equipment vendors that we have, who we partner with, are lockstep with us in figuring out where we can go next. And that is what we like to do. So we are in the process right now of zoning out all of New York and New York Metro. And I know we've talked today, uh, we have uh, someone from New Jersey here where I grew up, which is great because we're looking at our next expansion across the river because we wanna bring this same density and this same feeling 
to the people that we have where we've turned up Jersey City, we're turning up Newark right now. So these are the places we will serve next as we continue to densify in and edge out. It's really an exciting time. Skywire is a name because we also do business. And the reason I mention that is because our business services are what predicated the resiliency and redundancy within our network. That same network now has been morphed together as we've become one unified company. And that brings that same service out to the residential customers. We learned during COVID that you can be home, you could be at work, you can be hybrid. And having something that affords that same experience is really something our customers appreciate. And we appreciate our customers and the community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. Uh, now we'll hear from Flume. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Prashant, the CEO and co-founder of Flume Internet, and we are a last mile fiber to the home ISP here in New York. Flume generally uses unused fiber cables or open access networks to deliver fiber to homes across New York City and other cities across the US. We believe that with the new impending infrastructure build, over 20 million homes will be enabled with such open access or unused wholesale fiber opportunities over the next seven to 10 years. And we see that there's an abundance of fiber in certain areas in New York City and other areas where we will be using our own fiber franchise to build out services. We are a locally based diverse team who's passionate and has years of industry experience building out fiber in cities across the country. Today, I wanna to spend a couple of minutes talking about one of our favorite projects. Now, this is a two hour case study that I'm gonna cram into the next two minutes, so bear with me. Um, but for our initial anchor build out, we deployed into about 5,000 NYCHA homes in 2021 um, over the course of three months. This was spurred by the 2020 RFEI that was put out by the city. And for those of you ISP folks who have been trying to deploy into NYCHA and build new infrastructure, we believe that this is warp speed for these kind of projects. The project itself for us had two extremely positive vectors of growth. 100% of our fiber to the home installations were completed by technicians that we trained and workforce developed with other local community organizations who had never done any fiber work before. And so we think that that's a model we can scale across plenty of other projects. The second big number that we feel a lot of pride about is that about 20% of our subscribers in this footprint are signing up for their first ever home internet connection. And we think that that's proof that these type of programs do work. We couldn't have done any of this without leaning on the NYCHA tenant associations or the local community-based organizations. In fact, about 50% of our ECP onboarding of our subscribers happened at local community organization sites with a Flume and local CBO employee working hand in hand. In addition, we had to spend a lot of time investing in digital equity and onboarding. This means multilingual support as well as even creating email domains for our subscribers so that they could sign up for the ACP process. One of our biggest challenges has been around ACP uptake and we continue to lean on folks to help us raise awareness from subscribers. Ever since the EBB to ACP transition, we also do see customers sort of ping-ponging back and forth and using the benefit for LTE. And these are all challenges we think we can solve shortly. The project itself for us is a great economic success and continues to be as we have uptake and growth. We believe that with the impending bead funding, the barriers to entry for bringing in more options for New Yorkers will be solved and that more and more of these projects can flourish across the state. Thank you all. Thank you, Prashant. And next we'll hear from Verizon. Good afternoon, my name is Tabanya Davis and I'm Regional Director of Government Affairs and Public Policy at Verizon. 
Um, this is an exciting time for New York State, having over a billion dollars of funding uh, to be able to finally connect everyone who's been unconnected for so long. And Verizon has deep-rooted connections within New York State from Montauk to Buffalo. Uh, we have over 100 years experience in terms of building the best-in-class networks. And particularly for New York City, we're the only provider that has a robust wireless as well as wireline network. Um, in fact, we are 100% built in all NYCHA developments across the five boroughs. So given last year's launch of the ACP program, which you guys have heard a lot about today, um, this allows every resident within NYCHA to have free broadband within Verizon services. What we provide is um, upload and download speeds at 300 over 300 megabits per services. And we also provide no annual contracts, um, no hidden fees, as well as no data caps. So currently the ACP adoption rate is hovering around 40% which means that there are a lot of people out there that are eligible for this benefit and still not taking advantage. Um, on the screen, I put a QR code up where you can scan on your phone and get the sign-up process going because we need to have those enrollment numbers go higher. At Verizon, we are uh, committed to raising awareness on the ACP. Over the last year, we've done over 150 events across the five boroughs, which includes partnerships with NYCHA developments, as well as food pantries and senior centers. Um, the strategy was simple. We just wanted to meet people where they were at. And certainly, you know, we heard earlier today from some partners that we work with, including the New York Public Library, as well as OATS. Um, but even with these successes, there's still more work to be done um, from the work that we've done in terms of reaching out with communities when we reach a person who's unconnected to broadband and has never been connected to broadband. Um, it's rarely an issue of availability. And certainly with the ACP program, it's no longer an issue of affordability. Uh, it's more practicality. So if you've never had broadband before in your home, what's the chance that you have a laptop or a tablet? Very unlikely, and Senator Parker raised this. Uh, we agree with him. We believe that the lack of training and devices in homes is a major reason why many New Yorkers are remaining unconnected. Um, and to that end, Ultimately, when we're talking about the importance behind broadband, we can make no mistake about it. When we talk about the importance to the city's overall economic development, we're talking about a New Yorker's ability to remote learn, to remote work, to be involved in telehealth. And so it's important just to remember that the internet connection is not the sole solution because of these all other factors that are so important. So to move the needle forward, Verizon is committed to our work on digital equity and education. And we look forward to working with the Connect All office and forming public and private partnerships that's gonna ensure that this historic amount of funding is gonna ultimately solve the goal for all of us, which I believe is to make sure every New Yorker is gonna be connected. Thank you. Thank you, Tavania. And now we'll hear from New York Public Library. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, everyone. <clears throat> it's interesting. I, I was uh, getting out of the car today that I put my NYPL wireless hat on, and I'm joined by, by my director of strategy. I said, why are you wearing that? So I just wanted to see the reaction of everybody. And I was looking at some of my colleagues who are joining the panel, like NYPL and wireless, oh, what's the library doing in this space? Well, exactly that. In the previous uh, a panel, uh, a lot of my colleagues from, the, from NYPL, QPL, uh, and Brooklyn talked about some of the issues that we saw after the lockdown. People coming to uh, the libraries trying to get a Wi-Fi bleed. And all of our uh, presidents were wondering, how do we get the service that we provide in our libraries further out into the communities? And so I was having a conversation with my peers in Brooklyn and Queens, and they said, well, they're going to go ahead with the, uh, the Wi-Fi antennas to try to make that stronger, we decided to look at a new technology that's in the senator space called uh, private LTE or CBRS. Uh, and we decided to be able to uh, operate in that space. We set up antennas on five of our libraries, broadcast that into the neighborhoods and uh, controlled uh, territories, provided uh, networking kits so people were able to come and get Chromebooks and something similar to a Wi-Fi router. Take it home, plug it up, and connect to our to our uh, our service. So we did it as a pilot just to be able to determine whether or not it would work. We found that under the right circumstances, we're able to broadcast this reliably. 
So phase one was a success. We're looking at now phase two, which is to partner with organizations like my colleagues over there at CTNY, Silicon Harlem and others to actually put, uh, connect our antennas to uh, affordable housing buildings and actually broadcast the signal directly in those buildings so that New Yorkers won't necessarily have uh, any barriers or obstacles, whether regarding their device, if it's a laptop or a phone, they should be able to see the NYPL wireless uh, uh, signal and get onto it. We're not a direct competitor to, uh, you know, to the other folks on, on the panel, primarily because we're even looking to see, to get some of them to use our, our uh, roofs to broadcast a signal. But we, we think we're in a space where uh, some of our colleagues talked about issues of privacy. So we don't collect your data. We're not gonna give it to anybody. That's, that's just how we roll. Uh, uh, we're, we're, we're about collaboration. We're about, we're a 125 year old organization. Uh, we do networking. We obviously are into the wireless space. And I think we and, uh, and, and the, the uh, uh, private uh, uh, industry can work together to, to actually come up with a solution once and for all to a problem that, you know, as many people are saying, it should be a right to, just to have this and we're trying to do our part. Thank you. Thank you, Garfield. Okay, just let's give a round of applause to all those folks who are just really doing the hard work on the side of getting internet connectivity into people's homes in New York. Um, you know, I, I have the great pleasure of having had lengthy conversations with all these folks, uh, and I encourage you to follow up with them to, to learn more and to think about how there could be partnerships. I'm gonna hand it back to Clayton to transition to the second half of our uh, program today. Um, and uh, thank you all. Um, one more time for Clayton Banks, our MC. Get out of here. Well, I do have good news. Uh, the food is ready, so we're going to ask you uh, to certainly get ready for these uh, oncoming sessions that we want to have with individuals, meaning that we're going to have three different areas that we're going to have listening lessons, but you can pick up some food and go to one of those locations. We have uh, our facilitators that are going to be running those three areas. So one of the, let me, let me give you the name. So Monique Tate, who's the co-director of Community Tech NY. And uh, it'll be in, uh, Kevin Alexander will be in that same space, President CEO, Rockaway Development and Revitalization Corps. The second uh, one is uh, gonna be moved by Antoinette Gregg, Associate Director, the Knowledge House. I hope you know about the Knowledge House. The Brun. So, and then Allison Jeffrey, Managing Directory, I'm sorry, Managing Director of Digital Access Phipps Neighborhoods. Awesome. And the last one will be facilitators by Daniela Castillo, Director, Green Light District, El Puente. And, uh, uh wait a minute, that's right. And then there's also Gusan Effi, Community Coordinator for the Hunts Point Community Network. So those who can navigate people to the right space, they gotta go as quickly as possible. Quickly as possible. Greta, you wanna say anything? Greta is like trying to coordinate this. Huh? Okay. Okay, so that's Gason Effie from the Point CDC. Oh, I, I, uh, <laughs> Gason is over here. Um, facilitators, if you could please stand up so that we can... Put hand up like that, that's good. Okay, um, so we got Kevin over here and he will be with Monique in the green suit. Monique, say hi. Um, they will be in room 205. And then we'll have Antoinette and Allison. Can y'all say hi? Um, in room 206. And then we'll have um, Danny and Gaysan in room 232. So 205 and 206 are upstairs up on the uh, that side of the building. 232 is on that side of the building. And you can get to both through this staircase. Um, so 
if you, these are all the same breakouts, like you're going to do the same thing in each breakout. Um, so we'll have, if you're sitting on that side of the room, okay, you want to do it here? Here, Alex, please. If you're, see the pillar here, if you're on this side of the pillar, you'll go into breakout room 205. So remember that you are all 205. Pillar. Please go to breakout room 206. Remember that you are 206. And then if you're on the left side of the room, my left, you are breakout room 232. Remember that you are 232. I'm going to hand it back over to Clayton, but thanks so much. Please grab a snack and head to a breakout room as soon as you can. And these are light slacks. After the breakout rooms, we'll have full dinner. Okay. Come over here, Josh. Come on. All right, someone's double parked outside. Got to move your car. Or you're going to get a ticket. And you can't do anything but pay it by internet. So anyway, go get your car, move that out. Um, get a little snack. We're going to have even real good dinner later. But get the snack now. Get into one of these sessions. Room 205, room 206, room 232. It's the same conversation in all three, so you don't have to worry which one you're going to. Just get in there and say something. This is our time to say something, so please do this. Ladies and gentlemen, I just wanted to say, you are the best. The work that you guys have done out tonight, today has been incredible. This goes all the way up to the team. So I'm very excited to see the outcomes from this event. I hope you have a good year team. And uh, I'd like to wish you. So, eat and wait. But I do want to say, Thank you for coming out. I personally have been happy with you and I have here with Shell. But I want to say thank you for this is the major, major event today. I wish we could do it again tomorrow. But we're going to do this because we're going to get to step up to the governor's house. Maybe here's the president. And it'll be New York. Whatever you think. So, thank you very much for coming out. And this is a event. And I'm a pretty straight connected. It's over on Harlem. We'll connect all with the OTI and everybody else. Make some good relationships here now. And uh, I look forward to the next event. Our next event is coming up, but definitely mark this one thing in your calendar. October 10th, 2023. That's going to be our conference. And it will be our 10-year celebration. You're going to want to be at that. It's going to be crazy. So thank you very much. We're looking forward to it. I am Clayton Banks, and I am out. Thank you.